Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 118, So Long 2020, the end of year AMA. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. We record live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. All right, tonight we are saying goodbye and good riddance to 2020. What I truly hope will be the worst year of many of our lives. We'll be doing this through answering your questions live during the Ask the Bell set hop segment of the show. I think I missed a sentence there. I don't know what we're doing. We are going to be having a end of year AMA tonight. We are going to be answering your questions live. We'll be doing that during the Ask the Bell hop segment of the show. So feel free to bring up any gaming or non-gaming topics you feel like talking about before this horrible year comes to an end. After that discussion, we'll be taking a look at not one, but two Robotech board games from Solar Flare Games and Harmony Gold. We wrap up with some talk about the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle from both of us. And I do believe that Sean actually got a new game to the table with his kids over the holidays. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. First up, we found someone who was not impressed at all with Not Dice. Ryan Hall says, writes, that is a bit stupid, considering there are no numbers on them. All you're missing there is the all caps, very loud, no numbers on them. Well, thanks for the comment, Ryan. Uh, My guess is Ryan's a role player and was really hoping to find some cool Celtic Knotwork dice for using while playing some D6-based RPG or damage dice or blessed dice in D&D. Which I gotta say would be pretty cool. Like having D6 Knotwork dice with numbers on them would be pretty neat. But that's not at all what Knot dice are. These are a set of artisan dice that are designed to be an art object, as well as tools to play a surprisingly large number of puzzles and games, which we talk about in the review. Now, perhaps we should have been clear in the review. Maybe we should have noted at some point that these are not standard D6s. There are no numbers on the side. You can't use them to roll dice to generate numbers. But you make cool, not work patterns on them. Well, in stark contrast to this comment, we also find someone who loves Palladium's Robotech RPG Tactics. Warispan74 commented, It's a great game. It's sad that there was the first wave of sets only. I got three such core boxes and a lot of the extra sets. It was a great experience to build the tiny parts together. It was hard, but very fun. Well, this is a great example of how different gamers' tastes can be. Uh, While most people out there, I think, myself included, think the models included in Palladium's RPG tactics are um, ridiculous, to put it nicely, and way more work than I think they should be, there are gamers out there that love them, so that's cool. And I will note, this is only a snippet of an ongoing conversation that I've been having with Warspan about this the game, and not only did they like the model, they loved the actual miniature combat game itself, so... I think it's really cool that there are people out there that dig this game, that that, there were people who appreciated what was probably the most hyped and most in the media Robotech board game ever made. Well, if you want more Robotech content, be sure to stick around until the game room tonight, where we will be getting the Bellhop's opinion on two newer Robotech games, ones without super tiny detailed (laughs) miniatures to be assembled. Now, uh, Dian Li Zhang had a comment on our cool gifts for gamers that weren't more games topic from a couple of weeks back. I'm going on a cool tokens kick. For instance, I got a few of these on spec to see what they were like and will now order about 50 of them for use as monetary tokens in some games. The same place makes multicolored tiny glass ingots in the traditional style, and I'll be ordering these as well. So things like tokens, counters, etc. that are upscale would be a nice gift, I think. Oh, great suggestion there, Dianley. I I just wish Dianley had included some kind of link of what shop they were looking at, because I would have dropped a link in the show notes, and I'm not sure exactly where he's seeing these monetary tokens or these glass beads. But still cool. Any type of component upgrade I still think is a great gift, especially if it's bought for a specific game that you know that person loves. Well, next we have a few positive comments on some of our reviews, and we love getting feedback like this. First, EG commented on the YouTube version of our Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel review to say, appreciate the spoiler-free review. Thanks, G. 
Now, VB, known as at Skrell on BGG, commented on our Tyrants of the Underdark review to say, just discovered your channel. Thought this was a great review with lots of insight and picks while not being too long. Oh, great to hear both of these. I especially like the comment about the YouTube reviews. Um, I think adding in the still images that was something I think we started in 2020. It was either that or the end of 2019 has really helped those be more helpful to people in general so that they can actually see the uh, components of the games while we're talking about them. Unfortunately, those of you here live don't get to have that bonus. You just got to hear me talk, but you can also find the pictures over on the blog too. I also really like the fact that the um, VB noted that they like the length is about right, especially because Tyrants was actually one of the longer ones with the longer game description. Well, next up, patron of the show, John, uh, Joe Swick, had this to say about our Back to the Future Dice Through Time review. Bought on your review to play with a huge Back to the Future fan mm -hmm. who's expanding into new games. Well, thanks for the comment, Joe. Uh, this is exactly where I think this game fits. It's niche, right? Um, for us, playing here at home, we did find the game a little too light and repetitive for our taste, but I do think it would make a great gateway game towards heavier strategy games for a Back to the Future fan. Well, finally, longtime fan of the show, Tech2674, has a comment on one of our first ever reviews, the Quiver Card Carrying Case. It has been a while since you did this review, but ever since you have done it, I have wanted to pick up a quiver. Boxing Day, I ordered one and picked up today, December 28th, 2020. Thank you again, and I love my new quiver. Hey, publishers, did you hear that? Quiver time? You want to sponsor us again? You know, people seem to buy stuff based on our reviews. <laughs> I gotta say, Quiver Time does make some really great stuff, uh, despite just that, yes, they were our first font sponsor of the show. I liked the Quiver before that happened. Um, I dug it when I got it. I reviewed it pretty positively. But what I fell in love with it is when we actually brought it to BreakoutCon in 2019, and I carried it around with me, and I was able to have a bunch of games with me at all times. It really is a great piece of gamer luggage, and I'm glad Tech's enjoying their Quiver as well. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Before we get to answering questions, I want to set a, send a big thanks out to those of you who joined us tonight in the lobby for our chat room here on Twitch. Yeah, thank you very much for joining us for our last show of 2020. With the year ending and being in the midst of the holidays, we wanted to take things easy on ourselves and decided that we would finish off 2020 with a live question and answer session. As I was working on the show notes, uh, as it is, I, I was working on the show notes literally hours before going live. Actually, I think 20 minutes before going live, we were still making tweaks. I think we made the right choice to try not to cover a bigger topic here tonight. Now, before we get to your question, I do want to start by saying Happy New Year to those of you who are listening to the podcast right now or watching us on YouTube. Uh, it'll be 2021 for you in the future for us. Uh, congratulations to each and every one of us for making it through 2020. While it's been a tough year for many, there have perhaps shockingly been some highlights and good moments as well, like finally making a thousand fans on mm -hmm. YouTube. Thank you so much to for everyone who has subscribed to our content there or anywhere else really yeah things have grown significantly over the last year which has been awesome youtube was a huge i was not expecting it we went like it took us longer to get those first 500 subscribers than it did for the next which is awesome so overall 2020 was a very unique year um for those of us living it you know exactly why but just in case you happen to be listening to us for the future uh covid19 pandemic uh hit this year and that's a pandemic that's not only just going strong but at least locally it's worse than it ever has been we are in worse shape than we've been and things continue to get worse and of course this had a huge impact on all of us um caused many changes in our lives and some of which i worry may be permanent and some things may be permanent in a good way now, without getting into all the, the real-life details, we'll try to tie things into gaming here, since that's what our podcast's all about. So the big things that happened because of this was this was a year without physical game conventions for most of us, unless you happen to squeak one in near the beginning of the year. It also meant an end to physical gaming for some of us, or a change to gaming with a smaller, more personal group, our bubbles or our immediate family. So that's a huge change in our gaming habits for the year for pretty much the entire world. Now, on a positive note, though, this did lead to a plethora of online game conventions. 
so many online game conventions. Like there was a point where I couldn't keep track of them all. And it was like, I was finding out after the fact, it's like, well, didn't you see this at this con? I'm like, there was a con this weekend. And at least one weekend, there was at least three different ones overlapping each other. But I thought it was cool to see either the big con promoters as well as the publishers to take up that new format. Unfortunately, I've also seen a lot of people starting to burn out on the sheer volume mm. of online cons, as publishers do try to layer it on a bit too much of a good thing sometimes. Yeah, and there's a lot of competing ones. It's like, uh, no, I'm not going to bring it up. Some companies have done multiples. And I'm like, don't you, how many online cons are you going to do this year? But I got to say, it's been kind of cool. Along with the cons, of course, there's just been a lot more online gaming in general, um, both through video chat like Zoom or um, Skype or whatever, as well as various online tabletop tools. Like it was a record year for sites like Board Game Arena, who I'm still impressed by how quick they were able to step up um, right at the start of the lockdowns and greatly improved their services. And since then, they just exploded with like for December, they were releasing like a new game you could play every day. They no longer are their queues or waiting lines to get on the site. They've done some fantastic work upgrading. Absolutely. Now, all of this online gaming also did something pretty wonderful too, is it opened up the world of tabletop gaming to more people. With people forced to go online, a lot of work was done to make games and gaming more accessible and user-friendly. Just like companies that realized it was viable for you to work from home now, publishers realized that, yes, indeed, you can play a huge epic game with a thousand pieces like Twilight Imperium 4th Edition online digitally with other people. Yeah. Publishers, designers, and players have really embraced online play. Though I have to say some of the games I would like to see digital implementations of haven't made it to get official versions uh, with the ones you can find on tabletop simulator often getting taken down mm. for copyright violations or being so manual that you lose any advantage of the digital format at all. Yeah. For many of the games, just being able to play it is the only advantage you're getting digital. For example, that twilight Imperium version of tabletopia, <laughs> it's just a, a virtual tabletop with all the bits and you can do with them as you could with the physical table and it doesn't do any actual math for you. But overall, uh, the whole point is well, 2020 sucked for many reasons. I do hope each of you found something good to come out of it. Here's to what I hope is a much better year in all ways, not just gaming in 2021. Cheers. And now, on to your questions. Here's a question uh, we got. Here's a question we got yesterday from Mr. Green Eyes seventy seven on one of our Ask the Bellhop videos on YouTube. Any chance you guys can add time markers to your table of contents? All right. So when I first saw this, my first reaction was, "We do, right? Like I put timestamps in every week, and." Well, why, what are you looking for? And then I noticed, oh, wait, this is on an Ask the Bellhop segment. So what we do, if you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, is we produce this whole podcast, we record it live on Twitch, and then we put it out on YouTube, and we put the whole thing there so you can watch it from start to finish. But there are certain segments of the show, mainly the Ask the Bellhop segment and the game reviews that we pull out as individual segments. So it took me a minute to realize that Mr. Green Eyes 77 was watching one of the Ask the Bellhop segments. And well, I do put in timestamps for each segment. So if you go to the full show, you can jump to each segment. We don't break up the individual segments themselves. Now, the only place I think that matters is the Ask the Bellhop. Because in the review, I guess you could jump to our final thoughts. Maybe, I don't know. We don't really have a final thoughts section. But I can see it on the Ask the Bellhop. But it's going to be very dependent on what topic we're talking about. Because some of our topics, like tonight, it'll make sense because we're probably going to answer multiple questions and have different segments. But for example, when we were talking about um, people's competitiveness at the table and how to deal with over competitive players, there weren't really segments. It was just an open discussion. So uh, even it's something we even recommendation episodes, the uh, it would be kind of uh, painful almost to put in a, a, a link to every um, game. While though we could do a, we, uh, you know, the main games and then the honorable mentions as a separate uh, break. See, I, I don't know. The thing is, I'm already putting in a list of every game with a link to where you can purchase it. It wouldn't be that hard to add time after it. Though, again, like the time, the, like we don't spend a lot of time on each one. There's well, that's the problem. I mean, breaks, you're, you're right? getting in. I mean, sometimes you're getting into like, you know, seconds difference. You're not even, yes. you know, we aren't even spending a minute on a game. Um, so. Yeah, it's something definitely we'll think of for the new year. We'll take a look at. Um, it'll probably be based on how much time I have 
because finding timestamps is actually a little more annoying than I would like it to be on YouTube, <laughs> having to find the exact number to jump to. And and unfortunately, with my edit, I can't. It's I mean I I I, I can actually get a more accurate timestamp than YouTube can give us. So it right. may not actually translate properly depending on how YouTube counts frames and, and, and time essentially. Yeah, see that's it. Too, so even right? if like, I even if I were to pre preload all the times, I can't guarantee that they're correct. So you're still gonna have to go through and double check. Yeah, them. so I'd still have to go through and like I, the thing is I do tend to go through those whole episodes anyway, mainly to see if there's anything I need to link that I missed in the show notes. Because like while we do have show notes, we don't necessarily stick to them a hundred percent of the time. We often, especially when we're talking about uh games, go off topic and talk more about them or less than what's written here. So I do tend to go through to go, oh, wait, is there anything we mentioned that's not in the show notes? So there is that purpose to it. Wow, that did weird things. <laughs> All right, so, so posting from the chat into uh, Google Docs does weird <laughs> things. So we got two questions from uh, from tech in the chat room here. First up is for our, uh, our background moderator there, Angie Games. Where is the Canadian merchandise site? I'll let her answer when she hears it, but uh, it's not like the pandemic's gone away. And uh, although I think Ottawa is now doing better than we are, that's not going to happen. But you can go to our merch site, which we will link in the chat room and get stuff shipped to Canada now. So we are somewhat covered. Excellent. I am waiting to see. Deanna is asleep, so she won't be answering you right. anytime soon. <laughs> and I will keep an eye on moderating things. Yes. Um, next question being. What updates do you have planned for the podcast? All right. So we do have another question we'll probably get to tonight um, where we, we last week sent out actually the last two episodes. We've asked people for feedback. What do you want to see in the new year? We want to see, um, do you want to see more of something we're doing? Do you want to see less of something we're doing? Or do you want uh, to see something new? And we did get a bit of feedback on that, which we might as well jump to that right now, actually. So where do I have that? No, no, no. So uh, one of the things it? asked for leading up to today's episode was if anyone had suggestions for us for the new year, things like they would like to see less of, more of, or something we would yeah. consider doing. Uh, one comment we got from longtime fan of the show Dragon Gem was maybe more actual plays, but with a section beforehand that someone doesn't explain uh, explaining the rules. Also, maybe reviews of digital versions of tabletop games. All right, so that was the only feedback we got, which is fair. We got some. It's more impressive <laughs> than sometimes when we ask for feedback. Um, so no big plans to change anything as it is for the podcast. Um, we did just last month uh, rewrite the show notes so that it's a little more concise and we stopped sending you to the blog over and over and over. You'll notice I no longer say tabletopbellhop.com 10 times during every episode. <laughs> um, we're a little less rep repetitive, which so far the feedback's been positive. So the show's been tighter. Um, I've noticed it's been shorter too, though I can't promise that's going to keep up necessarily. <laughs> but we do aim for under two hours and hour and a half, four, hour 45, I think is good. So I think we're going to try to stick to that. We're going to continue to try to do two reviews a show because we got lots of stuff in the pile of obligation to keep up on. So I don't think there's a lot to change for the podcast. No, I think I the, the, the changes that we have just made, I think, are, are probably the most significant ones for now anyway. Yeah. Uh, you know, barring any uh, feedback uh, one way or the other. We're probably pretty tight on the podcast. Um, I don't know. What about, yeah, the, what about the YouTube content? What Do you, do you see... Any additional YouTube comment? So, so one of the upgrades we have done is I do have a new camera, so things should look better there. I'm still tweaking with it. Um, I did realize, so if you watch our latest unboxing videos, you'll notice wherever there's black, there's some like fuzz. It's it's well, except for there are absolute latest, which goes live Monday, has some other issues, but that that's totally different. But if you watch even the ones that came up recently, there's there's some static, and what I thought was happening was that the chroma key overlay from my second camera was picking up static, so it was trying to do it, and it ends up, that's not it. It The camera itself had chroma key turned on, despite the fact I don't really have anything green or blue around, because if I did, I'd notice it right away. It'd be like, whoa, what's it doing? So that was getting static, so that should be fixed, so that should be an improvement both for our live show and the YouTube version of the podcast, and while all future unboxing videos. What we haven't tried yet is to use this camera for an actual play. 
So that is one of the things when we do start recording actual plays again, you should be seeing two cameras. So the biggest thing you'll notice is the plan is to do again, like we do on the um, unboxings, we'll have the drop down cam, the close up cam. And especially when playing games like, say, Gloomhaven, we'll be able to show the cards a lot better. So instead of Deanna and I trying to hold them in front of the camera and get it to autofocus on the text, it'll be an overlay where the cards will just show up over top of the image. So that that should be a big improvement. That's going to use my old webcam. This webcam, which is now HD 4K, should be the one getting the image of the board. So we already improved the lighting, which greatly improved the way those videos look. This should be that next step to make it look even more clear, more crisp. So that'll be coming. Um, the one thing I will take from Gem Dragon's Dem Node is that if we do live stream anything other than Gloomhaven, because I'm not going to teach Gloomhaven every time <laughs> we live stream, um, I think we'll keep a teach at the beginning, even if we played the game before. I think most of our actual plays do have it, because almost everyone we recorded had someone new playing with us, so we did teach it. Um, and we explained the game as we were playing, but I, there must be some that don't. I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to watch them. To, just thinking about it, I'm like, well, we did Sorcerer, but I was teaching you to play that time. When we did Valeria, I think Valeria we might have just jumped in. I think Lopan we wouldn't have done a, a teach. Did we at the beginning, though, to teach how it was different? See, that's I what I can't remember. So. We might not have because so. we had all played the original. Yeah. So, yeah, that's definitely something. We'll throw a teach at the beginning. The thing is, I, I worry about putting out anything that's taught as a teaching video. Because it's so easy to make a simple mistake, right? Like we've talked about many times, many plays are extreme. You may not realize they're extreme. And they get criticized badly for being teaching videos. And I think to get a good teaching video, you have to edit more than we would, yep. right? Like we'd have to sit there and record a teaching video and double check it and make sure we got the rules right and highlight the cards. And I don't think I want to get into with our current setup doing how to play videos. Right. But including a bit of the teach at the start of an actual play, I can see doing it. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are great content creators out there right now already who do fantastic mm -hmm. teach videos. And they put the effort required into that content uh, with the edit and the scripting and, and the, the, the components. Uh, and that's, that's just not the, the content we're making at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, adding a teach is definitely doable. So uh, otherwise, equipment-wise, um, there was something I was going to wait to show off at the end of the show in the unboxings, but we now have this upgrade, which I have to figure out where it's going to go. So we now have an official green screen, blue screen. You can't really see the green from here. Nice. But there we go, green and blue screen. Awesome. The problem is I have no current way to hang that back there. <laughs> so plus we're going to have to, uh, yeah, I know, lots of crinkly sounds. <laughs> I knew there were, we woke Deanna up with the crinkly <laughs> sounds. So now we know how to wake her up. So yeah, I gotta, I gotta thank my brother-in-law, Deanna's brother for that. That was a, a, a Christmas gift that came in this year. So we do have a chroma key sheet. Um, we may try to use that for other things. Like I'm going to try to drape that over a uh, TV tray to see if that works better than the blue sheets of paper. I've been it will. using it, it hundred percent will. <laughs> yeah, it should. I hope so. The only thing I need to figure out. So here's where I might need Sean's ask. Um, is the uh what do i do to iron the thing like an iron or do i like steam it i mean in theory it steaming is it steaming ideal there? you probably don't depending on what it's made of you probably don't want to iron it because you'll get uh you you don't want to risk getting burns on it because that'll yeah what's well, cloth yeah i mean mine i i just hang it and it it does its thing it's a little wrinkly but it doesn't really matter that much to, all right with, as a so background we'll with, with the with the up close for the cards it might be more of a difference yeah. but um, the other thought too is, is to try easiest. it downstairs on the table, right? Is is to throw it out on the table, possibly for when we're recording, or if if we're even playing a game, we could green screen the back out. I don't know. Or when doing pictures for the unboxings, I might be able to do that, but I think that's probably not going to be good. But we'll I, see. I don't know if you if you did pictures on green screen, don't don't do anything with it, but just send it to me on green screen. Then I yeah. can pull it out really easy for the video. But yeah. again, that, that, that you'd have to do stuff separately for the blog. Yeah, so I'd have that's to up do to two you. sets of pictures, so we'll see. Um, so other than that, we got new lights, we got a new camera, and we got a green screen. So a way to hang the green screen. Um, I could obviously use a better, better camera, but I don't think we need a, at this point, this is good for now. No, I mean, at this point, uh, there's not really much more you can do with another camera. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so the, the big one, the big next step is going to be the PC for downstairs. So we have a local computer science guy who, guy I went to, to, to 
university with in computer science who now is the head tech at a local uh, PC place working on building us a new system, but he's having difficulty getting parts. Yeah, this is, this is again, this is a bad year for yes. buying computer parts in, in various different ways, whether it's webcams, uh, video cards, uh, or what have you. It's not, yeah, not the, the, idea. the current problem is the video card cannot get a high end or mid end video card, and we need a mid end. We don't need right. a high end, but we need a mid end. So until that happens, um, I don't know, I, I have no timeline on that, but we're going to get a PC, we're going to put it downstairs, and then we'll see. Um, what it should let us do is use three cameras when doing actual flights. Excuse me. So we'll have the board. We'll have the close-up cam that'll be an overlay, and then we'll have a camera showing us playing. Uh, so similar to what we're doing for Gloomhaven now, but you'll be able to see it live. Yeah. Hopefully all three of those camera inputs will work. There's a chance once we have that, we'll just move everything downstairs. So instead of my computer room backdrop, which is actually all just my miniature games, these are all Games Workshop miniature games behind you. You get the actual game room backdrop. Um, I don't know if that'll happen or not, but we'll probably move the unboxings downstairs for sure because we can get more lighting in that room and more room. Like, like this desk doesn't work very well, <laughs> and I won't have a camera where you can see my PC and the camera right. being recorded at the same time. There'll be less distractions in the background. So so that's the big one. So new PC is, is the next big step, I think. Now, anyone who's shopping our Amazon wish list, I'm sure Sean and I can put some more stuff on there that we could probably <laughs> use. But as far as the big upgrades, I know I could use some more audio input stuff for like a mixer in that for when we're recording so we can actually adjust people's volumes and all that but like that's another level that i don't think is going to improve our overall that much right and i mean like i've already got that on my end so unless you're recording without me we don't necessarily well, really i was thinking that. for the office for, for the actual place right yeah yeah right so that we can actually adjust the level so they like deanna tends to be quiet while playing actual plays and although real, I realistically tend to be loud. i i've found uh since the with the new mic placement it's been fantastic. It'll be interesting to see what happens when, when we there's four are, of us. when we're back to four. Um, ideally, um, a bo some sort of boom arm that could hold it in the middle of the table over top of everything yeah, would be the, nice. The but problem is finding a boom arm that holds this stupid heavy thing. Yeah, I mean, I've got one, but I, it's made for lights. I mean, it's huge. Like, it needs... Yeah. You, you, don't, you don't have the floor space in the basement. Probably not, yeah. To be able to do that because it's made for big lighting equipment. Yeah, I'd see Jeff saying shoot in the office and green myself green screen myself <laughs> into the basement to be honest um anyone who watches gms magazines youtube that's actually what he does which is kind of amusing is is it looks like he's standing in front of his game shelves but it's actually green screen um and you wouldn't know it he's actually in an office with a table with just a green screen behind him meanwhile the game room is actually in his basement similar to how i have it set up the problem with that is you want the table in the basement that's the the table yeah, well, yeah is that's it. not the, want, not the want... games in the background you need the table. yeah it's 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 having the, the table and the space and the room to spread the put this away because one of the problems we're having up here especially with the unboxings is how close i have to be to the camera because there's a wall there like there, i could move this whole desk this way but the way our office is set up it wouldn't work very well mm -hmm. so there's a whole bunch of that so i think that covers two of our questions at once there plus a couple extras from from tech now i will quickly answer this one this one's um, I did not get any notification that anyone bought anything on the thing. So this is the only reason I knew that Brian had bought a shirt was he shared a picture of our shirt and went, look, I bought a shirt. So like, there's gotta be something in Streamlabs that shows me. Plus they're supposed to pay us for people <laughs> buying merch. And I have no idea how that works. So I've never gotten an email saying anyone's bought anything. I don't know if there's something I don't have set up right. Or if I have to physically go to streamlabs.com and look to see what we've done. Right. So, no, I have no clue if anyone, like, as far as I know, the tech's telling me about something. Brian shared a picture. That's the only reason I know that anyone has any of our merch. All right. So, no clue. I, you know what? Maybe during the coffee break or the after show, I'll actually, like, bring that up and look and see if I can find something. So, the other thing that uh, Dragon Gem mentioned was reviewing digital versions of tabletop games. And there's, there's a whole lot of aspects about that. I mean, the first one being, uh, you know, while we do own some, um, you know, they aren't necessarily as free with review copies, or at least they, if they are, they are to a different market than us generally. Yeah. Um, those generally go to Twitch streamers and, and digital game reviewers mm -hmm. um, as opposed to physical board game reviewers. Uh, but the other thing is, is um, how you go about it. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to review a digital game compared to its tabletop version. Um, do you review it as its own thing? Uh, do you compare it to the physical implementation? 
do you talk about you know the some of the little bugs and how it's being updated how often it's updated uh multiplayer or solo and, and whether or not the ai is any good versus people you've actually played against in the real world um <laughs> the digital digital versions of tabletop games can be weird because you know is, is an ai ever going to be as good as anchi games at you know playing me probably not in most cases yeah i'll say the first time i played terraforming mars against the ai i was like what are you doing like they spend all this money on standard projects and i'm like what the heck but then they kicked my butt and i'm like wow i guess i've just been playing terraforming mars wrong <laughs> all these years because man the ai plays different than playing against real people right so i don't know i i thought about this you know what the, to me this is a 2020 question I don't know if anyone would even be asking this if we weren't now stuck in a time period where more and more people are playing digital games because I would rather play a physical game. So I would rather talk about a physical game and there are plenty of physical games out there to play. Like, it's not like I'm running out and I'm stuck only playing online, but now I'm at the point, especially now that we're in lockdown 2.0, that I'm limited to games I can play with the kids or games I can play with Deanna. So if I wanted to review a five player game, I'm stuck. Like, it, especially if I want to review a three-player game that's not kid-friendly, I'm stuck. And I couldn't review them without going digital. And I don't know. For me, it's more of the, do I have stuff to review? Yes, I have a pile of stuff to my right here from, uh, what's the company again? I always forget. Good Game Publishing to review. Plus, we have stuff, Robotech stuff to review we haven't gotten to yet. And some op stuff and a Ravensburger game I haven't reviewed. So I'm good. Like, to me, I would want to review the digital stuff if I ran out of physical stuff. Now, we do talk about our digital plays. So if Sean and I play something, we'll often talk about them in our week in review. And we have done a couple digital reviews. Like we reviewed um, Terraforming Mars on Steam, and we put that out as a separate video. I didn't bother writing a blog post. We just put it up on YouTube. So we've talked about some of the games on BGA, but I don't think I'd want to spend a full segment on talking about like the board game arena implementation of Clans of Caledonia. It just doesn't seem, it, it, and comparing the two. Although Jeff now, at this uh, point has just said he would like BGA reviews of implementations of games outside of the pandemic, uh, even if you just picked a small number of really good ones. So I, right. it's possible um, that we may end up doing a special episode or something where we do a See, BGA that might be episode. something we could do because we're one of the things for next year. We don't have a lot planned out for next year because everything we planned for 2020 didn't happen. So <laughs> I, th that's something we may do an episode of next year is I may find our New Year's resolutions from last year and actually look at them because I have a feeling it'll be pretty funny. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, To be I, honest, if, if not no. sad, but <laughs> I, I think we're going to have to laugh at it. Um, I was thinking we, we do want to reduce the number of AMAs. Once a month for an AMA is too much, which is why I was calling this a special episode. I, I no longer want to plan to have an AMA every month. I think AMAs are going to be when we need a break, whether those are every two months, every three months, once a quarter, whatever it is. I still want to have them because I love the live interaction. I love what's happening right now where Jeff's giving us instant feedback and we're able to talk back and forth. That part's great. So I'm thinking maybe doing that would be a good replacement because the one thing we did try was the review of Palooza. Well, that was great for YouTube views. It was terrible for everything else. Like, <laughs> like for podcast views, it was our worst episode ever published on the podcast. Our least downloaded episode was the review of Palooza. And then for the blog, like I have nothing, right? Like it doesn't give me any content for the blog except, well, four or five reviews. So I don't get like an Ask the Bellhop segment or anything. So it, it didn't really go over well. And for a live show, it was terrible. Like I, the people in the chat were just bored. Because they, they maybe cared about one of the six games we talked about if they even cared about any of them, right? Um, so I, that didn't work, right? Plus, then there was the work I had to do of publishing six reviews in one week, which sounded good in theory and was not as much fun as I thought it would be to get those done. So instead of that, though, if we did a digital episode or a combination, right? Like, we're going to review two things. We're going to review a digital one or not. But I'm thinking that might be a good replacement for the AMAs. It could definitely work. And I, again, I guess Board Game Arena would be for most of them because, well, most of those are free. One of us just needs a paid account, so that's right. pretty good. I would love to review more games on Steam. Like, I reviewed that Paranoia. Did we even do that as a segment? Or was that I, separate as no, a special episode? No, we did a video. Episode? We didn't do a... I'm, I know, I think we well, I did an see. actual play, and then I did... Yeah. I, I think we just talked about it in the week in review. Yeah, I think so. I don't even remember. I'd have to look. I don't remember what I did with that because that was one where someone reached out to us and actually asked us to review a digital game. And Sean did a review of one that was a... Or, well, it was a video game that very much could have been. Yeah, a it was a, it was a video game concept, uh, a you know, or version of, of what could have been a board game. It was a nice 
a day which actually went the, well except the video did stupid things yeah that audio. that was yeah like it, it was a good review otherwise it just it was hard to watch yeah, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah, the other thing, like Deanna's talking about, uh, review both the physical and digital versions of the same game. That sounds cool. Yeah. Like, I like that. We can even say for those, but then it just makes the physical review longer. So I don't know. I think different people are going to be looking for that information. We could start throwing it into our review segments if there is an online version, and if we play it and what we think about it. Yeah, I don't it's almost like I need to go to out and start, and start hunting down digital versions every time we, we're, we're, we're setting up for a review. Well, that's what I was thinking, right? And I'm like, most of the new stuff doesn't have digital versions yet, though it's going to switch the other way because now the digital versions are coming out with the physical versions because that's how they're doing their play testing. Yeah. Like, that's another thing. Like, as a reviewer, I've said no, but I keep getting asked to preview all these games and their digital versions. Like, we want you to preview it. We want you to do it here. Like, come do a demo with us. And it's all on Tabletopia and that. Yeah, everyone's, I'm just not everyone's that it. setting I it up play. there, there and playtesting there because where else are you going to playtest yeah, the game? Where else are you so going to do it? Right? They got it in the digital version before it ever gets to the physical So that's going to become more common. There's going to be more digital versions of games out there. Just to, like we talked about in the, the intro to this section, the number of online cons. Yeah. If a company wants to do game demos at an online con, they need to put out some version of tabletopia or tabletop simulator and almost everyone's gone tabletopia which is weird because at the beginning of the year we talked about the most popular ones and we said that we like um tabletop simulators better but tabletopia is the one that all the publishers seem to have embraced so i don't know if the technology's changed since the start well, of the year. i think i think there's i think there's more to it than that there's probably some politics and, and yeah, marketing and things money. involved um i mean tabletop simulator is still in many ways a very sort of it's accessible but it's a uh, bare bones and kind of mm-hmm. rickety UI UX. Um, so, and I think Tabletopia has got some some marketing people behind them and, and some drive to yeah. to you know encourage. Like Will Chamberlain to use saying in the in the chat room now is most Kickstarters that are launching now you can play them because you can play the digital version before backing the physical. Right. Which that's a shift that I don't even think would have happened if it wasn't for 2020. So there's one of the Definitely good not. things I guess <laughs> to come out of 2020. Uh, so Trasherim has asked in the uh, chat room, when is the karaoke episode featuring Mo singing Don't Go Breaking My Heart by Elton John? For anyone who's ever been to my house on a birthday or New Year's where I've decided to break out Rock Band 5, you'll know why that episode will never happen. <laughs> we may be able to get Deanna to sing, but it'd probably have to be a Billy Joel song. Uh, you won't be getting me singing anything ever, I don't think. Uh, you'll have to get hit me up at a con. And there'll have to be some beers purchased and then maybe a karaoke night or something. But no, not on the show. No <laughs> podcaster is going to gonna hear me singing. There we go. Uh, so patron of the show, Brett, or possibly Sean, from the Awesome Gaming and BS podcast, ask, how do two guys from Canada know so much about board games? All right. When I saw this, I know it was kind of tug in cheek, right? Like I, I think it's only Sean. I can't see, I see Brett um, <laughs> actually sit and running the the uh, the Twitter. I, I have a feeling Brett doesn't even know what what Twitter is. So that's just, it's, it's the sound you hear while you're out hunting in the woods because right. there's birds around. I right. think is probably what that is. Um, but no, like he asked this obviously as a joke. But you know what? I think there's a serious question here because, like, I, I want to deep dive this a bit because here in Canada. We are actually quite privileged in the fact we have pretty dang good access to board games, like like all kinds of board games. Even going back to like in the 70s and 80s when I was a kid, like um, besides the fact that we could get most of like the Milton Bradley Parker Brothers stuff, it was just, it was in your Zellers and your Kreskis and your toy stores. There was a Canadian publisher called Chieftain Games. And what they did is they localized pretty much everything else. So if you couldn't get the Bradley version of the Parker Brothers version, you could get the Chieftain version. And the only thing they did for the Canadian version is they included French rules. And the board would have to have French and English. So there was a translation. But the other bonus we had, too, was being part of the UK. Like, when I was a kid, we were literally still a colony. We hadn't even brought back the... um, constitution until what like 84 85 or something like that i don't know i remember sitting on a bridge and watching the queen go over but anyway we used to get access to a lot of the uk stuff so warhammer and games workshop most of the stuff behind me was actually easier to get here in canada than it was in the u.s and then there was also some cool canadian exclusives like uh, again behind me i have the hero quest nouvelle edition which includes men-at-arms figures that you can actually 
uh, upgrade the weapons on, and you didn't get that in the U.S. version of Hero Quest anywhere. So I, it, I thought it was like being in Canada, we had, like had unique access to the U.S. market, our own market, and the EU. Well, it wasn't the EU then, but the UK market. Nowadays, I we definitely can still get the U.S. stuff. Um, there is the advantage I'm in a border city, but I think this is true of all of Ontario. Like Toronto's basically a border city too. It's not directly connected via bridge, but there's there's ferries and everything. Like we're all very uh, U.S. Had soaked in U.S. culture and availability of pretty much anything in the U.S. Nowadays, though, I do find that, I don't know if it's because of the EU, it is a lot harder to get the U.K. stuff. There are the exclusives we don't see here. Like, I can't get go pick up the Star Wars version of Carcassonne when I can't get stuff like that. Isn't there a ferry from Toronto to the States? Um, to New York? I thought yeah. there was. No, I believe there is, actually. Yeah, like um, I, said, I thought I thought it was considered a border city that way. Uh, he's but, saying uh, beat me with a map to me I'm like the real answer is when you spend so much time keeping your gains away from the moose and keeping them dry in your igloo of course you learn a lot about them <laughs> there you go there's the tongue-in-cheek reply to the tongue-in-cheek question no but, but I, I mean it though like i like we have access to games like they're here right like it's it's definitely easy to get and you know what to be honest sean's right in a way we have a fairly harsh winter. It's not terrible, but like we have a winter and winter generally means staying inside and staying inside means you're bored and you play more games. So it's actually a true fact that the people who live further north tend to do more activities like play board games and play family things because, well, we can't go out surfing in, in December or whatever. Lots of so there is games. that aspect yep. of it. Hmm? That's where all the card games came from. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's why the Midwest, the Euchre, going back to one of our previous episodes why euchre and playing cards are so popular in the midwest right so that is a thing too so that's another reason um as for us personally i think it's just the fact that um i don't know i grew up my dad was a gamer and he passed it on to me right like uh i played a lot of games <laughs> other than that but i do think that we have an advantage being in canada at least southwestern ontario part of canada i don't i who knows how easy it is to get games in the middle of saskatchewan and it, you know what it was interesting in windsor specifically because in the mall, so in you know, at, in the eighties again, when we when everyone was going to the malls in the eighties, there was a what was a hobby store, but mm -hmm. it had you know because it was in the mall, it had a lot of games in it, not just mm -hmm. you know the trains and, and models and, and things that they were their focus was. That's where we got a lot of our games from. Oh yeah, uh, because and it was so accessible. Yeah, you know, it wasn't this hobby shop off in some strange corner of some strange street somewhere. It was mm -hmm. right there in the mall. And so every time you were walking through the mall with your parents, you wanted to go into the game store, even though for most people, you know, it was the place where people went to buy trains and little trees and hills. Yeah. And there wasn't just that, too. At Central Mall, there was Leisure World. They're yeah. not Leisure World. Um, Windsor Hobbies. So there was also Windsor Hobbies that if you were into trains, that was the better place to go than the mass market star at the Leisure World. But at Windsor Hobbies on, in Tecumseh Mall, which was a much smaller mall, but it was still a mall. They used to have that huge train set up in the window. And was, as a kid, you couldn't help but want to go in there and look at the train, right? Now, they had the more, um, they were more of a hobby store, right? But they also had games. That's where some of my TSR stuff came from. Some of my dad's AD&D stuff comes from Windsor Hobbies. And um, that's also where my Tente, which at the time, Tente was way cooler than Lego, but no one had heard of it. That's where all that came from. So there was that. And then, um, but like back then we didn't have, there was no local game store. So we never had the, the, the basement dwelling scares people away kind of game store thing growing up. It was always very accessible and definitely Leisure World. 90% of the stuff behind me comes from discovering Talisman at Leisure World, which actually started with picking up White Dwarf number 100 because it looked cool. I, the miniatures on the cover looked neat. And I bought that. And then from that, I bought Talisman. And from there, I decided games that stand up on your bookshelf like this <laughs> and have this symbol on them look good so we do that we buy that um wilt in the chats also mentoring dufferin game room they were so so they 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 were mostly uh pool tables and that and puzzles but they did have a but they did game. have a shelf they had, they had that yeah. shelf where you know there were a lot of you know those games that were still at you know hobby games or uh or or stuff like you'd you'd find on uh you know executive desks and things like not dice yeah. for instance uh yeah, the sort dice. of thing that you find in there yeah, and, and our toy stores never did though, so that was something in the states. Like if I if I ever went over the border, going to KB Toys was always great. Yep. 
the KB Toys used to have D and D and and RPG stuff, and they had they had like hobby board games. I could get stuff like that there. Whereas the toy stores here never, and even to this day, like Toys R Us is still left here, but you don't go to Toys R Us to buy board games. No, I mean it's mass market, pure purely mass market. Yeah. Oh, you might get Ticket to Ride and Catan there now, but that's yeah, it. you you can. But again, it's it's not the place I'd want to go to get them. I, I would no. never recommend. And, and you're going to pay full them. price too. Um, and some of it you're going to get, you know, you'll get the the sort of the strange, you know, ver- like the kids' versions of Catan and stuff like that. Yeah. More even more so than real versions of the games. You'll get those, uh, you know, again the mass market versions of stuff. Yep. Yeah, in general, we actually had access to games at an early age, and like I said it helps. My dad was into it, right? My my dad was a huge board gamer at the time. I remember everyone he talking to him like, "Well, you own over a hundred board games. Oh my god, <laughs> that's insane! You have a shelf, you have a room where you keep your game. Well, it was his computer room and his game room. He had a computer and board games in one room. That was a dedicated room. And RPGs. I keep saying board games. My dad also owned a ton of uh, Dungeons and Dragons stuff, and uh, Gamma World and TSR Marvel superheroes. So. And again, nowadays, that's probably not that strange, but in 1970, whatever, that yep. was kind of weird for someone to have a large game collection with that. Now, my dad's stuff was all war games, right? He was into the Avalon Hill, the advanced right. squad leader, that kind of stuff. I was the one that got into the fantasy stuff. My dad didn't. My dad wanted war stuff, not fantasy stuff. He didn't want. I'm pretty sure if he had known there was a, a war based RPG out there, he would have got that instead of D&D. Yep. But yeah, I got a ton of stuff, Leisure World. Even back then, uh, chap not chapters. What was the the local Coles? Coles Books Coles, yeah. used to be a good place to get D and D stuff. That's where a lot of my TSR Marvel superheroes came from. Crafty Business of all places, which was a place that sold like wool and stuff like that, is actually a place. I also got a bunch of stuff. I got my D and D stuff there, and some of my Gamble World stuff there. That was in walking distance of my parents' house, well, where I grew up. It's it's now a strip club, but at the time there was there was a craft store there. There was a craft store in that neighborhood. Yeah, see, Deanna's pointing out all of her D and D was purchased at Kohl's at Tecumseh Mall. Right. So it was it was accessible. It was here, right? And, yep. no, and well, it got cold in the winter, so we needed something to do. Yep. I think it was th- that combination of two things. Yeah, I think there was a lot more of it in in more places, um, and a lot, and it just depended on you know where you looked, right? A lot of people would maybe ignore the hobby stores because, well, who cares about, you know, train sets and stuff um, yeah. and, and or weren't interested into that. But, uh, you know, if you if you did walk into a store like that, it was there to be found. All right. Do we have anything from the chat room before I get to this question that we've been asked? Or at least I've been asked multiple times this year. Uh, no, it doesn't look nothing else right now. All right. Get your questions in. We're not going to spend too much longer in here. We've deep dived a few things already. I think it's gone pretty good, but uh, I'm going to bring this one up because everyone keeps asking me this. Um, multiple people, Facebook, Twitter, even our discord server have been asking, um, both two questions, but they kind of go together. What games did you get as gifts this year for Christmas? And what games have you played over the holidays? Now, as for the games we played over the holidays, we're going to get that in the week in review because the holidays were just last week and Sean and I both have some stuff to talk about um, more than usual, actually, in the last week. So that's cool. But as for which games you got for the holidays, um, somewhat surprisingly and not surprising to some people, I didn't get any in a way. What I did get, though, is the kids and Deanna went in together and did back the um, Pulse Hasbro uh, Kickstarter all in package. So at some point, uh, probably around November 2021, I think it's due to show up. I'll have a new unboxing of a new edition of Hero Quest. So that classic game that everyone's been, you know, grail game for many. And then I'll probably finally play it with the kids instead of breaking out my copy, which I kept meaning to do at some point and never got to. So we'll probably share the shiny new all together, the four of us playing. So that was the the big gaming gift that I personally got. Um, then there's the thing I showed off earlier. I did get gaming related the a blue slash green screen, chroma green screen for the background. Uh, the that's it for for me for gaming. Did you get any games this year? Uh, well, I mean, I I got for the family um, a copy of again thanks to Maple Leaf Games, uh, or Maple Game Deals, um, the Harry Potter Trivial Pursuit. Okay, because uh, my family are huge Harry Potter fans. Yep. Uh, and, uh, that was received, that was received well. Uh, apparently it, they, it's, it's hard enough that they are made, you know, and I mean, my family are big Harry Potter fans, mm-hmm. but they are, they were struggling with some of the questions. 
So uh, that went well. Uh, and then uh, back, I guess, month, uh, around or pre-Black Friday, uh, I picked up Clank again, thanks to uh, okay. Maple Game Deals. Uh, and while that wasn't a gift, um, that was we, we didn't break it open until the holidays. So. All right. So as for my kids, we did give them a couple games or a few games. Um, we gave um, Grace a copy of Disney Villainous which I never would have touched, but you know what? Now that I have played so many great games from Ravensburger and Prospero Hall, I decided to give it a shot. Um, I got to admit, she looked disappointed Christmas morning. Uh, she looked at it and saw the word Disney and immediately thought it would be a kid's game. So we had to kind of console her a bit and go, no, 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 this is like an adult game. This Not is a, a strategy. This, yeah. this is a hobby board game, and she seemed kind of sold on it. Um, she hasn't actually cracked that open yet, so we haven't gotten to try it. So we got her a copy of Disney Villainous. And I will admit, we got that a long time ago, and it was supposed to go to her on her birthday, and we forgot. And then we just didn't give it to her until later. So that was sitting around. So so we gave her that. And then for uh, Gigi, what we got was the Dungeons & Dragons Adventures Begins cooperative board game, which is something new Hasbro put out just for the holiday season, which is supposed to be your gateway to the world of Dungeons & Dragons. Now, I have no idea how tied to D&D this is besides theme, if this really is a gateway to like the role-playing game or not. And I made the mistake of thinking my kids knew what Dungeons & Dragons is, just because to me it's ubiquitous, and they had no clue. Like, they didn't recognize the brand, they didn't recognize the logo. Like, like they're here, we talk D&D a lot, but to be honest, when I talk role-playing, I don't talk Dungeons & Dragons a lot. It's not like I'm currently running a campaign or we're playing at 4th edition right now. Yeah, they were pretty um, young when you were do in the 4th the fourth, fourth ed deeply. Yeah, exactly, so. right? Like, the, so, so they, they, to be honest, again... I, I'm sure it'll go over great when they get it, but the kid was a little confused by the game, right? <laughs> she looked at it, she's like, it's Dungeons and, we're like, Dungeons and Dragons. And like, oh. <laughs> so we did get that. And then because we've been spending so much time playing Hogwarts Battle and the kids want to play through things in order and we mentioned the Monsters box and they were like, oh, we need the Monsters box. So we did pick up the Monster Box of Monsters expansion for Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. So sorry, the op, we're probably going to delay the Charms and Potions review even longer because we're probably going to at least try the Monster Box before the potions. So I, in total, three new games for the family is really not that bad. Uh, we've definitely had years with most. But as we talked about in the buying gifts for gamers, I don't ask for new games for, for the holidays. I've got plenty. Anything I want, I generally seek out myself. So. All right. So what did, what did the chat room get? I saw there were a few. The there, chat room's so. got a lot of stuff. So we've got uh, Tech got uh, the Duke, one of my favorites. Awesome. Uh, and he got himself his quiver, as we as discussed yep. earlier. Um, Jeff Seuss got Fury of Dracula, Bargain nice. Quest, Castles of Burgundy, Sherlock Files, and Dutch Blitz. Oh, cool. Uh, which version of uh, Castles of Burgundy? The new one, I'm wondering? Or the original? Uh, now, Red Beeple Ryan's saying no games as gifts this year, not even to himself. Just no enthusiasm without players. And I think that's probably oh, totally fair. something that's happened quite a bit. Uh, now, Wilt Chamberlain got quite the haul with Root, right. Quest for El Dorado, Quacks of Quedlinburg, and, and Gloomhaven's and Jaws of the Lion, plus Oceans. Wow, that is a good haul. There's some good yeah. games there. I still haven't had a chance to play Root. Actually, to be honest, with that whole list, all I played is Jaws of the Lion. I, I need to play Quacks. Like, people were playing that at WGR events right at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020. And I kept seeing it, and I was made the mistaken impression of, I'll get a chance to play it sometime. <laughs> so I never actually got to sit down and play that, but that one looks really good. Uh, Jeff did get the 20th anniversary edition yeah. of Castles of Burgundy. That looked good. I just couldn't justify the price when I have the original and don't play it that often. <laughs> Even though it's a great game. If I remember correctly, that's Wilt's favorite uh, Feld game, or at least it was. Uh, Math Guy Dave is saying he got Warhammer Underworlds Beast Grave, oh, and cool. uh, the kid got Dragon Realms. That the Underworlds was good. Like Sean and I actually played that, but we played the original, and I wonder if they've tweaked it a bit because that's now like the fourth mm. edition of that game that's come out. Like they keep putting out new versions with two new armies, but it technically I think they tweak things as things go on. Oh, okay, it's become a huge game. Like there's I think four different sets out now. Oh wow. I so did they, really like the original, though. Uh, they've I only gotten the tutorial battle done for so far. All right. Fair enough. Yeah, Quacks looks good. Uh, we've got the the uh, expansion with it, too. Herb Witches, if I remember correctly. 
<laughs> uh, Tech did get a sweatshirt from the tabletop bellhop, so that that's the oh, best yeah. gift of the season there. That's Rav the guy Dave points out that it took him two hours to put the minis together, and it lasted seven minutes. <laughs> There's a Warhammer game for you. Yep, that's that's, that's for Warhammer sure. for you. That that's Warhammer for you. Are they? I assume they're still the snap together kits because I remember the kits in in the one I have, which I still can't remember the name of. Night Vault? Go- I, no, it wasn't Night I can't, Vault. I can't remember. Shadespire. That's, Shadespire. that's Shadespire. the one I have. Shadespire. That's the one. That was pretty quick. Like, the snap went together quicker than I thought. Tons of trouble and broke a few. Wow. Okay, so maybe that's a change. Because the Shadespire ones went together great. Like, I think I had them done in half an hour, if that. Interesting. Kid uses the D&D action figures as sketch models. Yeah, their kids, like, they, they, they should know what Dungeons & Dragons is. Yeah, I don't think don't. mine probably wouldn't either. I mean, they, they understand the concept, like they know about fantasy stuff. And I mean, like I, my kids, my I think my kids even know what a mimic is. Yeah, yeah. My, no, well, my, my kids, kids like, definitely know what a mimic is. do know what a mimic is, that's for sure. That. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but most of it is from, you know, secondary things. Again, yeah. like Hermitcraft, like uh, Minecraft stuff and, and, and other things that have absorbed references from D&D rather than from D&D itself. Um, I'm yeah, interested like to see. I know they're rebooting the D and D TV show. I'm interested mm-hmm. that they'll. I'll definitely show them that. Whether or not they'll be interested or not is a, a different story. But see, I, have uh, the, I have the complete the original one on DVD, and I've never popped it in to watch. No, I, I like don't. on my own or with the kids, I but I own I it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think I could. Honestly, it's not really. I don't think it holds up all that well. <laughs> I don't know. I'd, I'd have to check it out. I haven't actually, I, it's, I haven't seen it since we were kids. So yeah, no, that was some pretty impressive game halls. That's awesome. This is where like, there's a bunch of people in the chat that are from Windsor and I'm like, Oh, we can't game. Cause there's so many games there. I want to play. I want to try them all. I, I still want to try quacks one of these days too. Yeah. That's... Quacks looks so good. Uh, uh, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton was playing that with, um, sebastian who we talked about when we were going back to our horror episode um sebastian one of the two of them owned it and they were bringing it out for every event like i've got pictures of them playing it at easy mode playing it at cg realm they even played it at our extra life and i just never got a chance to sit down the one time i actually sat down and they started teaching it and it was at easy mode and it was one of those new people walked in so i went over that and underwater cities are the two games that i most want to try now that wasn't mentioned tonight but that was another one where i sat down Wilt even got the geek up bits. That's where it replaces. The yeah, I, I, I remember plastic. watching uh, Underwater Cities. I think it was at Extra Life. Must have been at Extra Life. Um, as, as I watched around, but and it looked yeah. interesting. But I, I don't that one. I don't know anything about Quacks. I actually know a little bit about. But Underwater uh, Cities. Everyone keeps well. Everyone who likes it is pushing it as a better version of Terraforming Mars. And while with how much I love Terraforming Mars, I have to try the better version. Oh, I have a feeling I'm probably going to think Terraforming Mars is better, but I should at least try it. But it's it's another game where you're buying cards and building an engine, right? So you're right. buying cards, you're, it's a worker placement, and then you get cards, and your cards improve your actions. So you try to build better cards, and you're trying to connect some routes. Like, But it's the whole, the selling point that many people have been using is an improved Terraforming Mars. And I tried, I tried to get a review copy of that. Like I, I tried multiple sources. Like I tried going through the publisher and then I went, tried going through the designer and I'm like, no, no one's willing to give me, give me any, uh, unfortunately no one's willing to send me that one. So I got to buy it at some point. That's uh maybe if I end up with some money, I, I see, I don't think that'll happen this year. Usually I have gift certificates to spend after Christmas and I spend them on boxing day, but that comes from extended family. And because we didn't get together with the extended family this year, we actually just contacted everyone and said, let's just not exchange. Cause otherwise it's just like us sending gift cards to each other, which is lame. Yeah. Whereas normally like we have actual gifts that we exchange and my one uncle tends to be like, you need new games. Here's a <laughs> gift certificate for the game store which didn't happen this year he was willing to do it like he was like how do i get a copy of the gift store can i buy it digitally i'm like you know what like what we have for you is large and i don't want to pay to ship it to toronto <laughs> let's just hold off for a year yeah but normally yeah like underwater cities would be the one well i'd have to wait till after my birthday is usually what happens then after my birthday i'd be like all right we're, we're i'm going out and i'm buying the games that i really want that'd be up there quacks i don't want to buy i want to try it enough local people have it Root, I still need to play. That's one I'd love to try with uh, Wilt. But it's not like we're going to have a game night together anytime soon. Well, yeah, I mean, like, Root and Wingspan are two that I'm like, I can't believe I haven't tried Yeah, I haven't tried Wingspan either. <laughs> I, I, 
everyone everything i've heard about wingspan makes me think I'm, i don't need to play it but i feel like i should just because like everyone yeah, it's one of those it's one of those games that it, it's it's been such a topic of the world yeah. that it feels weird that i can't say i've ever played it <laughs> yeah I, everything i hear about it it's 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 lighter than the games i usually like i'm like yeah. I, do i really need a gateway game in my life probably not but i do wish i could at least say yeah i played it yeah that, that's the thing i have no interest in buying it but i want to say i you know i yeah. want to have the experience and understand why there are a large number of people who mm-hmm. like it whether or not it's for me or not well maybe if i did play it i'd be like oh my god this really is amazing <laughs> So I, it's possible. There are so many games. I gotta say that I, I appreciate this aspect of 2020. It's nice that there weren't the glut of games, which I realize is probably terrible for the publishers. Yeah. But it's been nice as a game consumer to not feel like I've fallen behind on everything, especially as a content creator, where we always say we're not always about the new hotness. We talk about games we like and the games we enjoy. But man, it's just last year. It just felt like. Like, there's still games from last year. I mean, Great Western Trail and Underwater Cities was another. Like, there's just all these game wingspan that came out that I just never got to. And that's 2019. Sorry, I'm saying last year. Because I know people listening now are probably in 2021. So I'm probably going to confuse everyone every time I say last year. Because this technically this episode comes out next year for me. A God, timey wimey podcast. Non-linear podcasting is annoying. Oh, yeah, well, Jamie's playing playing root with his kids which is awesome my my kids are still they're they're still taking baby steps into heavier games they, they enjoy some and others they don't once once uh gg was like back to the future dice through time was too much thinking and too much planning i'm like all right i need to step back with her meanwhile grace seems to be really embracing those games so i need to step forward with her but that's which makes it hard because now the three of us can't or four of us can't play together right like the kids are definitely at different board game levels right now right so that one's definitely interesting well i think it's time to wrap up this year's and ama thank you for all your questions I remember, you don't have to wait for an AMA. If you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop. Well, as an old school Robotech fan, I'm excited to take a look at Robotech Force of Arms, a two-player card game. First off, a big thanks to Solar Flare Games for sending us a copy of this game. All right, Robotech Force of Arms was designed by Dave Killingsworth and features artwork from Andorra Sidonia, Andrew Kramer, and Well Lopez. It was published in 2018 by Solar Flare Games. Now, this is a two-player competitive card game set during the Macross and Macross era of Robotech. Uh, this is the first series in the Robotech franchise, for those of you who don't know it like I do. Uh, this game recreates a space battle between the invading Zentradi battle force and the defending Robotech defense force, and includes a number of iconic ships and characters from the well-known anime series. Single game of this is a quicker filler, takes about half an hour. Now, to get a look at the cards and other components included in Robotech Force of Arms, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. So the main thing you get in this box, of course, are cards. Uh, Two decks of cards, including a couple reference cards. One deck for the RDF, the Robotech Defense Force, and one for the Zentradi. Card quality here is really nice. uh, Actually higher than I expected for a small box game. Has a nice linen finish on it that's nice to the touch. Means the cards aren't going to get damaged or scratched up. Though I got to admit, they're not great for taking pictures. They are a bit reflective. In addition to the cards, there's a 15-page rulebook and a number of counters. Now, to be fair, we weren't honestly expecting all that much from this game. It's a relatively small box card game from an established but not well-known publisher. So the fact that they put the effort into quality components was a welcome touch. Now, there's no board needed to play Robotech Force Arms. It's a card game only. You start by taking four ship cards from each player, your capital ships, shuffling them. You place the empty space card in the middle of the table, and then deal out the eight ships in a random pattern, making a three-by-three grid. Players then take the cards and counters for their faction, shuffle the combat cards, and flip one up to determine whose start player is, who's higher player. Uh, Start player, sorry, who wins that decides if they want to be the first or second player. Each turn, 
the first thing you're going to do is you have to move one of your ships. So you're going to pick one of your ships in the three by three grid and swap it with one other card, whether that's another one of your ships, the enemy ship, or the empty space card. Then you're going to play two of your combat cards somewhere on the outside of the grid, lining up in a column either or row with the ships that are out there. Each player owns two sides of the grid. So I'm going to play, say, this side and that side, and my opponent's going to play the opposite two sides. And each row or column can only hold two cards. When you're playing your cards, you can even play them together into two different rows or columns. Now, these combat cards all show various Robotech mecha and all have either an attack stat, shown like an attack burst, or a defense stat, shown with a shield, and then they're numbered, one, two, six. Both players' decks are identical mechanically, though they do feature different art. So you have one to six in attack and one to six in defense. Now, in most cases, you're going to play these cards face down, but a number of them can be played face up, which gives away what cards you're playing where to your opponent. But by doing this, you actually earn counters. Now, these are different little counters that give you some type of bonus. There's attack counters that give you a bonus to attack. Defense counters give you a bonus to defense. Ship lock tokens that you can place on a ship so it can't be moved around the board. And then, of course, being Robotech, there are protoculture tokens. These count as a plus to attack or defense. If you put them on your ships, they're defense. On the opponent's ships, they're attack. In addition, players do also have spy tokens. Those are used to cancel another player's use of playing a token. So if someone goes to put a defense token on your ship, you're like, nope, I use a spy. We saw that coming. Or you go to put um, you go to put a ship lock on the SDF-1, and you're like, no, 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 we had a spy. You don't get to lock my SDF-1. Play continues going around, right, around the tables, two people back and forth, um, until everyone's cards are played. So it is worth noting, every combat card is played every game. You ha are going to put all of them out, and it ends up that every location is going to have two cards in it by the end of the game. Okay, so you're moving ships, playing cards, and collecting tokens. Um, but maybe I'm missing something, but what is it you're trying to achieve? <laughs> what exactly is the goal of the game? All right, so this is one of those things where the game will make sense once I get to the scoring phase. Uh, so it all goes down to what you're trying to do is the ships in the middle are your capital ships, and they're moving around in this grid that represents space. The ships on the outside are all your fighters, right? All your mecha, all your, your Zentradi battle pods and all that. And they are trying to attack the opponent's ships or defend your ships or both. So it's all a matter of trying to line up the grid so that your ships in that row and column are doing whatever you want them to do, whether it's attacking the opponent or defending your ships. So that's kind of the summary of what you're trying to do. So once you've got all the ships are out, a battlefield set, you now have what's called a token phase. So as I said, when you play some ships face up, you earn tokens. Well, here's where you put the tokens on the battlefield. It's going to go in player order. You're going to place a token. I'm going to place a token back and forth until they're all placed. Now, after the token phase, you're going to take all of your command cards and all your hero cards. These are things tied to actual things that happened in the series and actual main characters from the show, right? So you got a Bree Tie and a Rick Hunter. Each deck has four of these. So there's four heroes and four command cards in each, each faction. You're going to pick two command cards and one hero to play. Now, what these cards do is they basically mess with what's already up on the board. So you're going to move tokens, you're going to place new tokens, you're going to swap the locations of ships. Uh, for example, the RDF can convert the SDF-1 into its like mecha form. There's, these are all things that are tied to the series. Now, what's interesting to note here is, unlike most of the games so far, these are not quite symmetrical. Like, I, I, I don't want to really say they're asymmetric because they're not very different. But, like, for example, the RDF will have a card that adds defense tokens to their ships. Whereas the Zentradi matching card that's similar instead attack, adds attack tokens instead of defense tokens. So they're, they're slight changes, but they're really close. So now, basically, with the uh, a token round done, you are you have gone through and you've, you've planned out your strategy. And now you take these new cards and undo everything your opponent did as much as possible. <laughs> essentially. Uh, sort of. Uh, see, the whole thing is... You're either undoing what your opponent's done or you're backing up what you did, but you only do get to play three cards and the cards do only have somewhat minor effects. Like the most powerful cards add or remove up to four tokens on different ships. So you are mo modifying things, but it's somewhat instead of much of what you've undone. So you're tweaking a couple of the battles, like a couple of the, the areas on the grid. Now, once you played, all the command and hero cards are played. You get to the scoring round. This is, uh, I wouldn't say the meat of the game. It's, it's more of a resolution round. So what you're going to do is flip over all the combat cards, and you basically sit and do some math. 
you look at each zipper on the grid, then you add up the attack value for all the attackers in the same row and column. You add up the defense value for all the defenders in the same row and column. You then account for the, um, the tokens that were played and figure out who has the highest total. Now, each of the ships also has a defense value that has to be breached. So that actually helps the defender out to keep their own cards. And the way it works out is if the attacker has more points the defenders than the defender had, they destroy the ship and they take the card to show they destroyed it. Now, if the defender has more defense than the attacker's attack points, they've defended their ship and they keep the card. If the totals are tied, the battle's considered a draw on the ship that stays on the board. Now, every ship has a victory point token in the corner, and all you do is you do the math. You add up the cards you got compared to your cards your opponent got, and whoever has the highest total won the battle. That space battle in Robotech is done. So after a bunch of randomness and a bunch of messing with each other and then a bunch of undoing and redoing whatever you did the first time, you play some Sudoku, and then whoever has the most points at the end wins. I get. I don't see the Sudoku reference. Uh, Sudoku, you're not adding the, stuff the, up, but the, yeah, the, yeah I guess know, you have the grid. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I guess with the with the <laughs> edges. So, I, as Sean kind of just summarized, what you've got here is a pretty simple, very mathy game, very math based. Like to be honest, this is the kind of game that Rainer Nitzia was famous for back in the tw- uh, like the year 2000, and is still well known for. And I, like, if no one, if I didn't see who designed this, if someone made me guess, I would have guessed this was a Nitzia game. I have to assume Mr. Killingsworth is at least somewhat inspired by Nizia games, like especially Kingdom. This really reminds me of Kingdom or the later rethemed Beowulf, the board game. That's the game this reminds me the most of. Now, while the game is pretty simple to teach and learn, you do have to watch out for those attack and defense icons. Um, Ships with attack icons only add to your total when attacking, and while ships that defend only add to your total with defending. And it's easy to make the mistake of you're going to add up all your combat ships. Like, I'm defending, so I add up all my ships, and I'm de- attacking, add up all my ships. You only get to attack, add the ships that apply for that particular type. So if you're you're fighting over an effect, opponent's card, your attack cards matter, and if you're fighting over your own card, your defense card matter. Now, I note this specifically because someone got this wrong in our first play, and it did kind of ruin the experience. Now, once you do have the rules down and you've got that figured out, the game does play quick. Uh, It doesn't take up a lot of room, which is something I appreciate. This could be a coffee table game, right? This is something I could see playing at a coffee shop. Um, I wouldn't personally bring it to a pub because there's lots of cards and you don't want cards getting wet. But, you know, a coffee table where you can keep the drinks far away. Um, Really what you're ending up with is a four by four grid, where it'd be five, five by five grid, because a three by three and then the outside edges. So it's pretty small. Um, While there is some strategy to the game in trying to decide where to place your combat cards. And there's a bit of a bluffing element, right? Where, where, where they put their six is that an attack card is a defense card due to the fact that your cards are probably going to swap places every turn. So every turn, two ship cards are moving. One of them might be the empty space, but like two of those are going to change. And the fact the range of the combat cards is from one to six, which means like there's a lot of randomness in this game. Like despite the fact the first turn you put, put out your six attack and right now it's lined up with all of the enemy ships by the time you get to the end of the game all those ships will move it it, where your six is like someone might put something there but it seems to be it's more happenstance like they happen to move their ship back to your six not that you made a good plan to get them to move to your six and then there's the command and hero cards that add to this because it's going to let players make some last minute changes to the battlefield and that can quickly ruin some best laid plans Now, I think some people are going to love that aspect, right? Like, especially in a quick half-hour game, people like random elements in a half-hour game. It's definitely better than playing a three-hour game, and then you get to the end and some random element changes it. And for me, though, and for Deanna, I think we both would have preferred more control over our destinies, more actual, the strategy and tactics paying off more than the random elements. Another somewhat minor complaint about the game is the lack of theme. Like, yes, it's Robotech, but there's not a lot here that says Robotech other than the artwork and the names of things and the fact I recognize the characters. Yeah, you're playing out a space battle with big capital ships and you're attacking and defending with waves of light fighters on the periphery of battle. So you do kind of get that there. And the swapping of ships kind of feels like capital ships maneuvering around, I guess. It's just a bit, like, it's just a bit Robotech, right? Like, it's not the opposite. Like, the theme doesn't not mesh like it's not like there's there's a disparity where you're like oh this theme doesn't fit this no it just it's not tied very strongly 
Like I could easily probably in an hour retheme this entire game to be any mass battle. Like if I wanted to do the Romans facing off the Carthaginians, it really wouldn't be hard. Overall, Robotech Force of Arms is a decent quick filler. I do like the decision points in the game, and I like the way the mechanic work. I like the math. I like doing the cross, like I'm trying to figure out my two ships versus your, or sorry, my four ships versus your four ships. Uh, the high amount of basic math in the game really does remind me of something from uh, Rainier Nitzia, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I like Nitzia's games. Despite some strategy being required, though, it does have a rather high randomness factor. And this is going to be a bane or boon, depending on your personal preference and the person to playing with. For us, I would have preferred more strategy, less randomness. While it's not the most thematic Robotech game out there, the artwork and characters do give you a bit of a feel of playing out an epic space battle between the invading Zentradi and the Robotech Defense Force. Well, I think this one is definitely going to be a pass for me. But who should pick this game up? Well, it's going to depend mainly on how much you care about Robotech and the Robotech license. Plus, if you're looking for a mathy quick filler, or if you're not. Like, if you collect everything Robotech and haven't heard about this game, because obviously not many people have, based on how many people have reviewed it and looked at it on Board Game Geek, go ahead and add it to your collection. Like, this is definitely not a bad game. There are only a handful of Robotech games out there worth having, and not only... And, and this is worth playing, unlike some other Robotech games that may have been published by other publishers. It's a light filler game. Uh, it's a pretty solid abstract light filler game. We had fun playing it. Um, my original plan was to keep it. Like, it was good enough, and it was Robotech, and I like Robotech. Then, though, I discovered the next game, the next Robotech game from Solar Flare, called Robotech Crisis Point. And once I discovered that, I started to rethink my idea of keeping the original. Now, you're going to have to check out our review of that to see why it's making me reconsider my choice to keep Force of Arms. Now, if you don't like math-heavy abstract games with themes that are barely tied to the mechanic, don't bother. Like, there's no reason. This isn't going to win you over. This isn't like the, the be-all, end-all. This might get more people to play abstract mathy games. Now, Kingdoms might have done that for you from Nidzia, but, but for Robotech fans, there's enough here to like that I think it's at least worth checking out, give it a play, or just get it as a collector to have another Robotech piece of Robotech in your home. Well, be sure to check out our written review of Robotech Force of Arms by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. And now a look at Robotech Crisis Point, the second Robotech card game released by Solar Flare Games set during the Robotech Masters time period. First off, big thanks to Solar Flare Games for sending us a copy of this game. A Robotech Crisis Point was designed by Dave Killingsworth, featured artwork from Andorra, Sidonia, Andrew Kramer, and Juan Lopez. It was published in 2019 by Solar Flare Games. Crisis Point is a two-player competitive card game featuring the Robotech Masters era of Robotech. This was the second series in the Robotech franchise, uh, both for the original series and for this game collection. Now, this game is a follow-up to Robotech Force of Arms, released by Solar Flare the year previous, so uh, 2018. This game recreates a ground battle between the Invid Army and the Army of the Southern Cross. Now, while it borrows a lot of the basic mechanics from Force of Arms, it does expand on and improve many of them. Now, if you haven't already done so, I do suggest checking out my review of Force of Arms, though I will be repeating the basic mechanics here in this review for those of you who can't find the time. Now, before we get into those mechanics, I also want to point people to our Robotech Crisis Point unboxing video on YouTube. It's a great way to see what you get in the box for Crisis Point. Now, the first thing you'll note if you do know both games is that this is a much bigger game than Force of Arms. And that's in many ways, not just physically. For one, the box is just bigger. This also includes a four-panel game board. Now, this is just a grid to place cards on, but it does help you organize the card and does feature some great Robotech Masters artwork. Now, like Force of Arms, this game does include mostly cards. Now, these are of good quality. Uh, they don't have quite the same finish as the original game, which does make the cards a little bit more vulnerable. But I do like the fact they don't re reflect light as much, which actually makes them more useful and easier to play, especially in my basement with the pot lights. Now, on Crisis Point, in Crisis Point, um, each side has their own deck made up of unit cards, combat cards, a base, command cards, hero cards, and end game scoring cards. 
In addition to that, there is a shared neutral deck of strategic locations. All of these feature excellent Robotech artwork and iconography. Now, along with the cards, there are two punch boards with a really high number of counters for each side. These include battle tokens, victory tokens, and then for each side, there are two specific unit tokens that are tied to specific cards. So four special tokens as well. And all of these are generally the same solid quality we saw from the previous game in the series, I expect? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's pretty much as good. They don't quite have that same linen finish, which I know does make the cards a little bit better. But again, that not having that made them actually easier to see well out on the board. So it, it's a compromise one way for playability, and I think I'd rather have that replayability. Also in this game, there's no you don't randomize your cards. You're choosing what to play. So by reducing that ecology, even if your cards get banged up, it doesn't hurt anything. There's no random draw in this card, except for determining who's start player. Now, a game of Crisis Point starts off with a blank board. Now, the board has a 4x4 four four grid on it with the spots of, at the end of each rolling column where you're going to be placing combat cards. The middle is called the battlefield. Players are going to look at their hand of objective cards and pick two to keep in use for that game. So you're picking two end game objectives. You're then dealt four random strategic location cards out of the deck. Players can then take their command and hero cards and put them aside because you don't need them until the second part of the game. Starting with the first player, determined by a random draw of combat cards as I just mentioned, players will do the following steps in order. The first thing they're going to do is place a unit, base, or strategic location card onto the battlefield. Now, all players start with eight units, one base, and four strategic locations. By the end of the game, though, they're only going to place five of those units, two of those locations, and their base. So you're not playing all your cards every game. When they play the card, you're going to activate it, and you're going to collect battle tokens. So each card works a little different. Locations have text on them. You read off the text, you carry it out. Usually it's going to let you assign battle tokens from the pool of pool to cards already on the board. When you play your base, you're going to gain battle tokens into your personal pool that you can use later. And you get it based on the number of combat cards you have left, which I actually thought was a really cool mechanic. So the longer you wait to play your base, which is one of your most valuable parts on the board, the less tokens you earn. So if you get it out early, you get more tokens, which is kind of neat. Units are all mecha from the series. They generate more battle tokens and usually have some kind of special effect. Most of those effects in this are tied to where the card's placed. So you might get extra tokens if you place next to your own units, or you might get extra tokens for placing a tank next to a strategic location, or it might let you attack enemy units that are either adjacent or not adjacent and so on. Once you've then played something out to the battlefield, you're going to pick one of your eight combat cards and play that on the edge of the battlefield. Each player has an identical set mechanically, like they have different art, but they're mechanically the same, worth two to nine battle points. These cards are paced, placed face down, and once you get to the resolution phase, they're going to affect all cards in the row or column they're placed in. So placing these can be huge. Then you're going to take one battle token from your pool that you've earned, and place it somewhere on the map. Now, very different from Force of Arms, these tokens count as plus one for your side. So if you play it on your unit, you're defending that unit. If you play it on an opponent's unit, you're attacking that unit. Play continues until the battle folds full and all combat cards have been placed. So, well, we still have a game that, so far at least, has a lot of resemblance to the first. It's clearly a far, far more robust game mm -hmm. with a focus on strategy over what was often, often randomness in the other, especially by the fact that you're not, you know, starting with that pre-assembled mm. uh, fleet. Yes. Yeah, there's a lot more control over what's happening in this game. Now, there are still some random factors, like that plus one to plus nine range that you're putting out those combat cards, that's huge. But the board's not going to shift every turn as it does in the other game. Now, just like Force of Arms, after the board's filled out, we do have that token phase. The difference here is you're going to have a lot of tokens. Every unit you put out earns you these battle tokens. Now, every battle token's plus one. Again, depending on where you put it. If you put it on your own units, it's defense. If you put it on your opponent's units, it's attack. If you put it on neutral units, it's also attack. No one's defending those. So you, what this works is you have so many of these is you're going to place two, your opponent's going to place two, you're going to place two, your opponent's going to place two, and go back and forth. In addition, you may have earned special tokens. So four particular cards in the game generate special tokens, and those are also played during this phase. So without getting into details, I'll just, like, the Invid have a drop ship that lets them swap out one of their units on the board for a Battleroid in their, or sorry, a Bioroid in their hand. 
and the Southern Cross has like a missile launcher that's going to damage a friendly unit, but do a bunch of damage to the other things around it. So there's just a couple special things that make the game a little more asymmetric. Once all battle tokens are spent, we then get to the combat, or sorry, the, um, the command phase, where players are going to play command cards or hero cards. They have a set of these at the start of the game. You're going to play two of each. You're going to play two command cards and two hero cards. Again, this is almost identical to Force of Arms. These powers are very similar between the two factions, but not exact. Um, some are going to, most of these are going to add battle tokens one way or another. So you're either going to add units to your own units, or you're going to add them to your opponents, or you're going to add them to neutral spots and so on. Or you're going to swap or move tokens that are already out there. So interestingly, one of the Sun of the Cross one was remove three of your tokens from anywhere on the board and stack them on one opponent enemy unit. So it was called coordinated effort, right? So that's the kind of things you have in this. Interestingly, Invid in this case are more defensive, where the Southern Cross is more offensive, which is the opposite of the RDF and the Zentradi in the first game. Once everyone's played all their tokens and everyone's played all their cards, you then enter the scoring phase. Flip over all the combat cards and do some math. So what you're going to do is you're going to start with any one card on the board. You're going to look at it, and you're going to add up the battle value for each faction. So this is going to include the combat cards and the row, common, row column for each faction. So your two cards and your opponent's two cards that you just, you know, cross them off. Then you're going to add up any battle tokens on the card. Now, what I strongly suggest, this is not in the rule book, and I don't know why it's not in there. Because you're just matching number for number, we just paired off the battle tokens. So for every one of my battle tokens on there, I removed one of Deanna's. And then you, whatever's left is your actual map, right? You're just going to simplify the math. Plus, it declutters the board a lot. So I actually suggest doing that before doing all this math because I don't see why you wouldn't. Like, it's just going to make it easier. In the end, whatever card has the highest battle total is going to put a scoring token on the card. Ties are rewarded to the owner of the card. Now, what's a little bit of a problem here is it doesn't tell you what to do here for a strategic location because every other card's owned, but those strategic locations are randomized at the beginning. So it doesn't tell you what happens in a tie here. Now, we went with whoever was dealt the card and played it on the board, counted as owning it. Though I could also see having it just stay as a, um, a, a neutral spot, and if you have a tie, you leave it on the board, which is actually a mechanic from Force of Arms. But to be honest, in the rules, it doesn't say either way. Once all the battle ter field cards have been scored, you're then going to grab those objective cards I mentioned right at the very beginning of the game, beginning of the game you pick two of these or you're going to score the one worth the most points and i actually really like this mechanic i i've played many games where you pick an end game scoring card and you keep it but you score both i like that you only get to score the better of the two so that's that's a neat mechanic i had not seen before now these include things like you took both bases or you own at least three strategic locations or you got the three of the four corners or you have a bunch in a row and so on there's a bunch of these they are identical which is worth noting they're the same for both factions you then add up the victory point total of all the cards you captured, as well as your victory point card, and whoever has the most points wins. All right, so I, I can definitely see the steps where we've advanced here from the first game. Mm -hmm. uh, the level of strategy is way up compared to that yeah. first outing, uh, and the complexity is ramped up in multiple ways. Yet, when you get down to it, uh, once that strategy uh, section is done, it's more or less the same game yeah. on a bigger board. Yeah, it's very similar. Like, I, I, you can tell one's the evolution. And when I first checked this game out, the first thing I did is I went to Board Game Geek to go, were these released a year apart? And I think that's what happened was Force of Arms hit the market and they got feedback, right? Not that I see that feedback on Board Game Geek, but I have to assume they got some feedback and then took that feedback and improved on the original game. Because this is very much an evolution of the gameplay and mechanics of Force of Arms. And I got to say, in most cases, it was all step forward. They were improvements. Like, overall, the game's just bigger and more involved. There's more going on, more decision points. And the number of decision points at every step, there are more of. Like, every turn, you're not just playing a combat card. You're playing a unit or a base or a location. And then you got to pick a combat card. That Right there, you're adding four different branches compared to the original game where all you played were combat cards. And then you're also going from a 3x3 three three grid to a 4x4. Four and then you're filling that, right? One kind at a time. It's not randomized. You are choosing where to place your units on the battlefield. And you are strategically and tactically placing those. And that's a huge part of the game. And position matters more. Because there's very little in this compared to the other game. In the other game, every turn, card swap. 
in this one there are like two command cards or two heroes that let you swap or reposition units and that's it so of your 16 cards maybe a couple are going to move and one thing i do want to note that we actually got wrong on our first play so i think this is important to note is adjacency in this game does count diagonally so when you play down that battleoid and it says you get a command point for every adjacent unit that actually counts diagonally as well I didn't expect diagonals in a grid focus game. Usually when you're on a four by four grid, you don't tend to go to the corners. Yeah. Normally you don't consider diagonally adjacent. Um, no. and, and I expect a lot of first time players will probably make that same mistake. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, a, a bell hops. Well, your first play of every game is going to be an extreme play. That was our extreme play in this game was we totally messed that up. And it was when reviewing the rules that I, that I noticed the problem after the fact. Now, well, many things in Crisis Point expand on Force of Arms, right? More decisions, more things going on, bigger board. There are some things they did to simplify the game that actually made it much smoother and easier to play. The biggest one is the fact they ditched attack and defense. Everything's battle points. It's, I put my token on, it counts for me, for one. It doesn't, if it's on mine, it counts as defense. If it's on my opponents, it counts as attack. Done. You don't, there's no trying to remember what you put where, trying to figure it out. All your combat cards just add more stuff. And then I, I like this. I think this was a great change. It's, it's just less fiddly. It's less math. It's less to worry about. All your numbers are dead simple, especially when you do that pair off when you remove a bunch. And another thing that's streamlined is you only get eight combat cards. So there's less math during the math phase at the end of the game. There's less variation because of it. Now, in the other game, you are going to add eight units to every fight. This time, you're only adding, adding two of your own, which is a big change from the last one. Or sorry, four. You're going to add eight total. You're going to, yeah. So the other game, you put two at each location, you add them up. So you have four per side. Here, you only have two per side. So I like that. It's, it's half the number of math and, and variation per row column. Yeah, and I'm sure that that uh, keeping track of the the attack defense difference um, was was problematic for enough people. I, I don't. I'm not surprised at all that 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 could be seen and as a you know sort of extraneous and just get pulled out in the yep. in the upgrade from game to game. Uh, while I can see someone might want the flexibility of that attack defense difference, if it encouraged extreme play, that's not helping your design. Yeah. And like, like it felt like the attack defense mattered more than the other, like you were making more decisions, but it was just, you're adding more numbers. Like it was just a harder number. Okay. My ship doesn't count for this fight because it's an attack ship and I'm using one of my own ships. So I'm obviously not going to attack. So that one doesn't count. And it was just, it was more fiddly. Right. Streamlining that was really appreciated. Now I did note most things were improved. So I do have a couple of complaints about crisis point. The first is the amount of ambiguity in the rule book. This one does not, was not as clearly written as the original, and there is at least one printing error. Now, in regards to the ambiguity, the most egregious problem was trying to find out where to get your battle tokens from, because the game comes with a ton of them. So clearly there's like a pool of them, right? And do you get them all? I'm going to play every one every game. That seems crazy. But then certain cards give you a number of tokens which you don't put on anything. So you must have like your own pool, right? So you must have like uh, uh, a central resource pool that everyone can pull. Well, not everyone because they're color coded and then you make your own. So you're like, all right, fine. So then I play the strategic location and it says, place one of your battle tokens on two adjacent cards. Well, where do those come from? Do I have to have them in my pool already? Or do those come from the central pool or the central supply? I'm assuming probably the central supply. I don't know. But then when you play a unit, now, units are different than locations. That's a type of card. When you play a unit, every one of them has a number on it. And that's the number of tokens you get to take from the pool to your supply. And then that card, say, like, these are all different, but one specific card says, place a battle token, when played, place a battle token on a non adjacent unit. Well, is that a token that I just earned by playing that unit, or does that come from the pool? Like, I... Like I tried to Google this. I, I'm like, all right, this is bad enough. This is this is this is a pretty big mistake. Let's Google it. Unfortunately, this game, no one knows this game. This is a, a hidden gem in a way. This is a many people have overlooked this game. No one's seen it. No one's heard hold a heard of Solar Flare. I don't know what it is. Or no one's cared. I don't know. There's nothing. Like like I went on Board Game Geek and there is literally not a single FAQ or rule discussion post on the, the entry, which is just rare. You don't tend to see that. So to get through your game. You and whoever you're playing with are going to have to sit down and decide these things because 
I, it's honestly not clear, and I'm still not sure what the right way is to use these counters. Yeah, well, while Board Game Geek is a great resource, the smaller publishers, like, like this one, uh, don't get the full benefit because there aren't enough people playing the games to have questions or to know the answers to, mm. to, to fill it up there. So unless you get a little conversation started, there's no, no snowball to build up and get those mm -hmm. FAQs and things uh, rolling in the forums. Yeah, like we ended up deciding uh, after the first game to change it because originally we were only spending stuff in our personal pool. And while it gets to, because there's another rule that says every turn you place one token, well, you only get to do that if you own. It says if you can. So it has to mean you could get to a point where your pool's empty. Like there was just, it came up multiple times. So before you play the first time, just sit down with your opponent. I don't think this breaks the game. But depending on how you decide, it is going to change the feel of the game and how many tokens you generate, and thus how much impact those tokens are going to have on the game. Because if you generate lots of tokens, you're going to be able to counteract that plus nine combat card. Whereas if you're only generating a small amount, that plus nine combat card is going to win that whole row no matter what, right? So it's definitely worth talking about. Now, there is one obvious typo on one of the Southern Cross objective cards. This card gives you three points for capturing at least two opponent's batloids and if they only put one on the board you can still get two points the problem is the invid player doesn't have any batloids and we went through the entire deck to check what they have are bioroids now thankfully it's pretty obvious this card should say bioroids and not batloids but because of this every other card that said batloid and bioroids i don't even know if they're right or wrong so for example the invid player has a card that says get plus one uh get one token for every batloid you're next to well, is it supposed to be Batloid? Is it supposed to be Byroid? Is it supposed to be if it's near attackers? Because that matters, because the one side has Batloids, the other has Byroid. So I don't know if anything else, we played with rules as written, except for that card. So we just assume every other reference to Batloid and Batloid, Batloid and Byroid were accurate. Heck, I can't even say them, so I can see how they made the mistake. <laughs> yeah, it, it's frustrating, but hopefully it's not really a deal breaker. It, it does seem at least... Like it was just that one typo. And thankfully, because. that one typo was on the obvious card where yes. you knew it had to be wrong. Yeah, it was obvious. Like partway through the game, our first game, I'm like, wait a minute, do you have any cards that say this? And and D's like, no, I don't have any cards that say that. I'm like, all right, I'm going to assume that it must mean this. Now, my other complaint about Robotech Crisis Point is the exact one I had for Force of Arms. And that's the fact that this is pretty much a math heavy abstract card game that doesn't really use the robotech license all that well like it does have the card art and the names and their well-known mecha and you get all your characters from the series uh, there's not a lot here to make you feel like you're playing a ground battle between the invid and the southern cross except for those names the fact they have a card that says dana sterling on it just doesn't really make me feel like i'm playing dana sterling now similar to the first game in the series again you could retheme this to be any two-sided battle either historic or fantasy so a level up from the original, but still ultimately a Nitsi or tri Nitsi a tribute, tribute. Yeah, no, I agree. If it, it still feels like a Nitsi game. Now, overall, despite a few flaws, uh, Deanna and I really enjoyed this Robotech themed card game. Uh, like I quite liked Force of Arms. She was a little more ambivalent on it. Uh, I, the first Robotech game from Solar Flares is a decent quick filler game. This takes all the good parts of that and improves on them. It's a much more involved and strategic game overall. Building the battlefield as you play, right? Pulling the cards out as you play adds a lot of strategic and tactical elements and actually makes you feel like you're positioning things and have control over the battle. While the combat cards do still add a pretty random element, especially because they go from two to nine, uh, unit positioning and how you spend your tokens does have more of an impact. I also greatly appreciate how the scoring system was streamlined by getting rid of the whole attack defense thing and just switching to a generic battle value value. The other thing great about this game is that you don't use your cards, all your cards. So force of arm, every game is going to feel the same because you play the same battle cards. Every game you, you play eight of them every time this time you're only going to, you're only selecting two secret objectives out of your pile. You're only going to play five of your eight units. You're only going to play, you get randomly assigned locations, and of those locations, two are never in play, and you're only going to play two of the four you got. 
So not only are out of the well, whatever, I don't know, do the math. We each get four, so there are ten. So out of the ten, only four are ever in play, and out of those four, no, oh, sorry, only eight are ever in play, and out of the four you have, you're only playing two. Whatever, you only use some of your locations. Uh, this greatly increases the replayability of Crisis Point, especially when compared to Force of Arms. So we're, we're we're definitely a little past the coffee shop game here on this one. Yeah. Uh, with space and 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 complexity, at least. Time as well. Like you're looking at an hour play here versus a, a half hour, fifty minutes to half hour. You're looking more at forty five minutes to an hour for this one. It's definitely a a, a deeper, more involved game. Now, I, I found Force of Arms to be a fun distraction. It was neat. It was kind of cool. This is a good game. Like, this is solid. Uh, it builds on the Nitzia-like gridded math mechanics from Force of Arms and improves on them in many ways. It's a both more tactical and strategic, and it feels more like your decisions matter and the randomness factors ramp down. Added to the fact you don't use all your cards every game makes it more variable, adding to its replayability. Now, there are some ambiguous ambiguities in the rule book and until there's an official faq or something out there i do suggest discussing these before you play the game they aren't game breaking and do note there is one card with a typo on it while i do recommend robotech fans check out force of arms and picking this up because you're robotech fans you're going to want this just because it's a robotech thing i think crisis point is going to be bigger than that i think it's going to appeal to abstract game fans with or without the robotech license there is a very solid game here. And to me, that nostalgic theme is an added bonus. Now that theme's not tied in well, I do enjoy playing with heroes and mecha I recognize and knowing what the two factions are. If you're looking for a solid Robotech hobby board game, so far, this is the best one I've played. It's engaging, replayable, and fun. If you enjoy math-baked games like the type Rainer Nitzi is famous for, well, this isn't one of his games. You may want to check this out. For anyone that's not a fan of abstract math-heavy games, you probably didn't make it this far into the review anyway, but if you did, this is probably going to be a skip for you. Unless, again, you're that huge Robotech fan and you just want to collect all things Robotech, then you might want this one for your shelf to show off. Be sure to also check out our re written reviews of both Robotech Force of Arms and Robotech Crisis Point by heading over to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Reviews. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at games we've played since the last episode. All right, due to the holidays, we actually got in quite a few games this past week. It felt good for a change, actually, like sitting down at the game table and playing stuff. Uh, so besides a bunch of Robotech card gaming, which I think we just covered enough in the review section, uh, the main thing we've been playing here at Casa de Bellhop is the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle game from the op with the entire family. And I actually got physical games to the table, including Hogwarts Battle. Nice. That's great. I love it when Sean gets to talk games, too. So we've been playing um, Hogwarts Battle 4-player, and so far, it, it's been pretty easy. And I know it's going to ramp up. I realize I'm probably cursing us by mentioning this. Uh, but we finished Book 4 with no tokens on any locations, never got to Location 2. So that's the same as Book 3 here. Um, now, I personally think this is a big part of this, is the fact that that we're all playing very tactically and we're playing all four characters for one. And we've each fallen into a specific role, which is of course, based on the abilities the characters have at this point. So Deanna's playing Neville and specializes in healing. Grace is playing Hermione and specializes in deck manipulation, getting us extra card draws and collecting cards um, and being able to put cards on her deck. So she gets to use them right away, as well as using the thing to remove death marks from the characters. Now, Gigi is playing Harry and is collecting mostly item cards. And again, sticking with the, any card we can get that removes location marks and doing a bit of damage dealing. Now, I'm playing Ron, and I specialize on doing as much damage as I possibly can. And this has worked out really well for us overall. So I assume we're going to be sticking with this pattern. Yeah, so we, we've also uh, sort of locked into the character we're playing, but there's only three of us in our game. Yeah. And I'm wondering if that might not be a significant mm -hmm. change and maybe a part of what's happening that we get to later on because no one plays Ron in our games. Yeah. See, I honestly think that's it. I'm thinking what you probably should do, the game seems to be balanced for all characters, mm -hmm. is have someone, probably you, play two characters. Quite I possibly. think that might be because we seem to be blowing through it a little easier than you did the first time. 
Now, I mean, in theory, it's balanced so that if you have four players, you're, you know, more thing because you're doing something every turn, you know, you are turning over more dark arts yeah, cards and things, but you're not getting that advantage of any time I do at least three damage, I get to heal someone for two right? by not having Ron, right? You're not having, you don't have a damage dealer in the right. group. I think it's like the balanced D&D party theory seems to be part of it. Now, again, this could totally change because I know it's about to get a lot harder. So now I know this isn't a legacy game, but if you haven't played book four already, you may want to skip ahead a minute or two. I, I'm thinking by this point, everyone knows what's going on in this game, but just in case, you might want to skip ahead and then come back in a couple seconds. So the big thing that book four added to the game were the dice, and I gotta say, I like these dice. It's a neat way to add in a random element. And when I heard there were dice in this game, I just assumed they were gonna put in some stupid roll to attack system, where like to defeat the villains, I was gonna have to roll a 16 or higher on a d20 or something like that. Some form of output randomness, which I don't like in these kind of games. And it's not, and I was so glad. And I liked that the results give something to everyone. It adds to that cooperative feel and that working together and the whole Harry Potter, I don't know what they call themselves, the Scooby Squad. Like them all, the, the kids all working together. And I also dig how each die is unique and that there's more of a certain symbol on each of them. So, you know, when buying cards, we tend to stick to the specialties I just mentioned. And it's worked well, though I got to say, being Ron and trying to collect all the Slytherin cards does seem a little unthematic. Now, based on my social media feeds and a couple Discord conversations, you've also been playing Hogwarts. So where are you up to and how'd that go? Well, indeed, we got the monster box of monsters back to the table. Now, pre-pandemic, we did manage to beat box one of four in the monster box of monsters. So okay. I'm pretty sure that this was actually our second attempt at box two. It went very poorly, though. Oh. In fact, it went so poorly that we just reset and went over and, and played again because we lost the entire all three locations in less than full five times around the table wow <sighs> i don't know I, I we'll see i take again monster box of monsters under our christmas tree yeah. uh we're gonna obviously finish off the first box of the game first and see how bad it goes but yeah now, i don't know now we didn't win the second time either but we actually had fun and achieved something in the game. We got okay, some of the cool. villains removed. Right. Um, rather than just constantly trying to keep our heads above water, which was all we were doing in that first, the first time wow. through. It was just desperately trying to, you know, give ourselves one more health so maybe the next Dark Ark card didn't mm -hmm. kill us all. Um, the most amusing thing I saw, found when I was checking the rule book was in the Monster Box of Monsters rules, they discuss how to up the difficulty levels Ow. of the game. <laughs> Like, I, I, I know, like, just paying attention to board game media at the time, that when the original came out, there were a lot of complaints that it was too basic. It was too easy. And I think they put out Monster Box to, for those people, right? Like, hey, I, we thought we were marketing this game to kids, but all these hobby gamers are playing it, and they're gaming the system, and they're playing too well, so we're going to really challenge them. But yeah. I don't know. I, yeah. said, I, I look forward to, to discovering it when I get there. I, you know, and I have to say, maybe the next time we play this, uh, the fourth player may come out. Maybe I will play the Ron at hand as well uh, and see if it makes a difference. Because, right. um, again, the first time, the second time we actually had fun. You know, we we got a few yep. villains off and it, it was good. But that first time, you know, by the time the third time around the table, so each of us had played three times, there was no way of winning. We finished it out. We, 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 right. Because it had been so quick, there was no point in, it wasn't going to take long. Um, but yeah, I mean, three full times around the table and we knew it was lost. There was no yeah. returning from that. That seems rough. I don't know. Like having the fourth character also means the market rotates a little more. Right. You get to see a bit more cards, especially if you're specially buying, right? I'm leaving that for you and I'm keeping this for me and make sure you don't buy that so I can get it. By having another character in there, that's also a way you get to see more cards. That might now we did actually too. end up clear, clearing the market, uh, which was a, a a rule they added in Monster Box. Of oh, Monsters okay. Because you, you weren't allowed to in the original game. No, you're not. Uh, they do the... say they do say go ahead and do that uh, in the original game. You know, it was something that they realized they should have left. But we were left with at the beginning of the game nothing but five and six cost cards. Yeah, see, which that's... is impossible. I mean, there's literally no way to buy that stuff. So uh, we, I, I think Hermione could have, if the right combination of cards came up at the right time, and she didn't yeah. lose anything from Dark Arts cards. 
Yeah. But uh, it was, you know, it was sort of like, yeah, okay, we gave her one chance to, to get that combination. And it's like, no, none of us are buying anything. We need to clear it. Yeah, because so. if she plays four cards, she gets an extra turn up, right? Right. But, but that um, would still, and she'd also have to have. She had to have. She had to dis. Well, she would have had to discard one of her cards that gets you know, the extra coin when if you discard yeah. it, and it was, it was possible. So we gave that chance. See, we we but... have so far in none of our games had an impossible market come up. That hasn't happened yet. So right. Well, and again, Thankfully. there are more expensive cards that are added in Monster Box and Monsters. See, because that's the other harder. thing too. Is I, I've noticed as it gets on, there are definitely more expensive cards. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Which, which is, again, it thins the deck, right? Well, it makes the odds of finding cheap cards more difficult. Yeah. Right. So in addition to physical games, um, I, we do both, I'm sure, have the usual sampling of board game arena games going on. Uh, the one I want to call out this week, because, again, we don't cover every game we play on there, or else that'd be the whole show, is the, the Sean and Mo play board game arena show, is uh, Race for the Galaxy. So in our most recent games, Eric, who's running the, running the show, tossed in the Alien Artifacts expansion. Now, this is the first Race for the Galaxy expansion I've used online that I actually don't own the physical copy. Now, the reason for this is I've avoided that one because I have heard from many Race for the Galaxy fans that it changes the gameplay too much, that it just doesn't feel like Race for the Galaxy anymore, especially the fact there's like a new board and things move around on the board. Now, the part I don't get, and if you know this game, please help me out here. I, there's no board. Like, I'm playing on Board Game Arena, and just there's new cards. And I'm not sure what's up with that, because, like, some of the cards have abilities that say, like, move your something, and there's no thing to move. So I don't, I don't, I honestly don't know what's going on. Now, what I will say, I liked a lot of the new cards. Like, either the cards that did come up, the new attack cards, or not attack cards, the new um, rebel cards, and some of the new Imperium cards. There are new attack cards, too um and just some of the new planets and there were some really interesting ones that did some new combos of abilities i like that but what's with not having a board like it seemed really weird like i'd get this card and it's like yeah it's a give you a bonus when colonizing alien worlds great but move your thing two spots i have no idea what that means so, so what what it is is actually the orb so there's actually two halves to the alien artifacts uh expansion there's okay. the, 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 the base game, which is like 49 cards of, of the Alien Arts expansion. And then there's also the orb, uh, which is okay. the actual, the tokens and the exploring of the orb, which is another set of 40 some cards that do that. And I noticed, so I, I just it... checked and it, it specifically says expansion, Alien Artifacts, no orb. On, but did the on board the game arena screw up and put the orb cards in? Well, maybe some of the portion, some, some of the, um the aspects have them both okay because like i said there's definitely things that are move your things and whatever right. i don't know i like overall i gotta say what it did do i and this is bad because i don't have a spare budget for it right now is this made me want to buy alien artifacts just to figure out what the heck's going on uh both because i'm confused and i want to see it and touch it because i definitely that's the one thing i've learned is i definitely do better seeing things in front of me than digital I definitely am a, a touch it, handle it, sticks in my memory person. Um, just play Onitama with me online, then play in real person. You'll know, see the difference. Um, I, I want to pick this up now just to see it. Plus, I did like the whatever the non orb cards or the combination. Like the, there were some neat new cards. I'm like, I, I play Race for the Galaxy a lot. I have, it's the one game I have played over a hundred games of, and seeing new cards that work in new interesting ways was really neat. I'm like, oh, maybe I have to get this. But I don't know what's up with this orb thing. So. <laughs> Now, you got another physical game to the table, right? Absolutely. Well, I've actually only ever played it before once with you. This yeah. was the first time ever my kids got to play Clank. Nice. Now, we picked this up again, as we said earlier, thanks to Maple Game Deals on Twitter. Uh, but I sat on it for a while, as my viewers have said, probably seen in the <laughs> background, uh, you know, looking at my, uh, my video. So the actual interest for this from my kids came from Minecraft. Uh, as okay. someone set up something sort of similar uh, based on, off of that um, online and that they got to watch on YouTube. Now, I have so to say. So it was like a delve and come out? Is that the. Yeah, it, and they actually used Clank, was the, one of the mechanics okay. he used in the game. So, uh, you know, making too much noise in the dungeon did things. Ah, okay. and, and so cool. that was what got them interested in, in the whole idea. Now, I have to say they loved it. Uh, nice. And I didn't stumble too much with our first time through <laughs> following the Dublob's rule. Dublob's rule. Uh, the worst prob problem we had was that my initial shuffle was horrible. 
Um, oh yeah, and they grouped the cards. Yeah, when, the, the cards were very well comes. grouped, and and it it yeah. the shuffle the shuffle was bad. Um, so that was that was the the biggest problem we had in that first game. Now I was the only one who made it out, but okay. it was my daughter who managed to take the win uh, nice. despite needing rescue from the castle. Yep. So both the kids nice. enjoyed the game, uh, and they will be happy to see it on the table again. Uh, and I met, when I mentioned that there was a solo version with the app, cool. my son was interested in that as well. So uh, we'll see. I want to hear about that because for the amount of time I've owned that game, I never remember there is an app. Because not only is there an app where you can play solo, but there's also an app where there's like a wandering monster when you're playing multiplayer. Well, yeah, there, it's um, there's basically when when one of three uh, actions happen in the game, you click a button in the app and it may or may not do something for you. See, that's just cool. I, I just, I've never done it. I never remember. Anytime I bring out Clank, I forget there's a Renegade app. Like yeah, so there, there, there's a there's a, a guardian okay, in yeah, the castle kind of... that the, uh, the the dragon has hired, essentially, is what they, there you go. What they call I it. Say it just sounds cool. Like, it's just a little added bonus. And the solo is Clank. actually, uh, basically, uh, the solo version is quests. Um, so, as well as, hey, you need to do this in this number of turns mm-hmm. before moving on to the next quest. It also says, take these cards out of the the, the uh, market so okay. it, it helps you cycle the market rather than oh, okay just so it's like it. someone else is there buying so it's, it's you know these Very two cool. cards come out come out of the market um uh but interestingly like the first the first challenge that came up when i was just started exploring it was you know you have to buy this card within four turns which sometimes depending on the deal could be pretty rough yeah that sounds uh, like it could be rough so be one of these days maybe i'll play it <laughs> I don't know. I'm just glad you got at the table and your kids liked it. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is such a, I, we have, I don't think we played Clank with the kids. The kids have played a few deck builders, but not that one. Yeah, no, it's definitely it's, not both. We might've played it with, uh, with, uh, Grace, but I can't, I don't think we did. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a fun one and, uh, they, they loved it. So, uh, we'll, we'll see that one again. Probably. What, what about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So I have a pile of games beside me, which is a new pile. I, th- I actually have a physical pile of obligation right now beside me, uh, all from good games publishing. So there's six games, five games, some expansions. There's a bunch of stuff. I got to get those unboxed. So I think I'm going to try to get those done in the coming week, get those done. Um, we do have a third Robotech game from Solar Flare Games that I want to get to the table. Uh, I don't know if we'll get to it next week or not, but this looks completely different. This is no longer an evolution. Um, I don't know if they decided Crisis Point had hit the epitome and they were done, or if they just decided to do something different. So this one is cooperative, uh, two-player. Uh, well, we're no, it's not two-player. So we're swapped from a two-player competitive game to, uh, I think it's like up to six-player cooperative. So that's a huge change. And it doesn't look like it uses the math-heavy grid mechanic at all. So it looks like something completely different. So that should be interesting. Um, We, of course, do plan on continuing Hogwarts Battle into Book 5, which everyone now has us very scared of um, because they keep telling us it's really hard. Uh, The kids did get a couple games for Christmas. Um, I wanted to play those, but I'm letting the kids come to us on that. So I I don't want to push them. And, well, we got a new Nintendo Switch for Christmas, so I think they've been a little too distracted by their new tech um and then the uh one of the other kids got another piece of tech and some drawing tools and she's been busy creating art for her fan base in scratch so they they've been doing their own thing so they're still sitting there i'm sure the day will come so that could happen anytime that one of them's gonna walk up to me with one of these games and say let's play uh what about you you got more clank coming more hogwarts well i'm hoping next weekend i have some time to get something to the table before the kids restart uh school digitally um yeah. on uh, on monday but uh we'll see I did you're going limited... back that early i thought it wasn't like the 11th uh is it this is the second week isn't it yeah this is the second week so yeah i believe the fourth is when they're back so I thought digital. I thought the kids that were swapping to digital were going back on the eleventh. Uh, I maybe. But maybe that's different for different school boards. Yeah, I'm not. Know. You know what? I'm not even sure. I, yeah. They're going to send us emails and. Yeah, <laughs> like I know our kids are going back on the fourth, but they were digital already, and I thought the kids transitioning from in person to digital. Well, went they, back on they the had, our board, our board at least had sort of prepped everyone. You know, everyone make sure okay. you can log into your Google accounts and and get everything ready. So. Mm. Oh, oh there physical go. goes back on the physical 11th, goes back on the 11th. The people well, we'll who are crazy enough to go back on the 11th. Uh, uh, I'll be. Yeah, I, I knew there was something with the 11th. Yeah. I was hoping our kids would be off till the 11th. To be honest, like they're home anyway, but it's been nice being able to play games with them. No, absolutely. All right.
Now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Matt Lichtenwaller. Thanks, Matt. Roger Malosh. Thanks for sending in some questions, Roger. We'll be getting to those in the new year. Zopi, thank you. Brian Sheen, great seeing you on the Discord server and in our chat room for the first time. Yeah, it was good timing, and I wasn't planned ahead of time. I had to show off the notes just to show that that was a, a happy coincidence. Uh, David Miller Jr., thanks, David. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to the end, and Ryan's here, so we're going to have to drop the portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us at Tabletop Bellhop. One word, you can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com and sign up for the Tabletop Bellhop newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts here at the Tabletop Bellhop, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thanks for joining us, and be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And And game game on. on.